Good. Uh, so I, I have uh, just taken my slides off the meeting uh, for a minute and put up a picture. Uh, there's a, a little apology for coming to you from Adelaide. Um, it's a real pity that I couldn't be there. I'd love to actually be there in person talking to you guys. Um, but the University of Adelaide took uh, uh, matters out of my hands and decided that I wasn't travelling sometime last week. Um, so uh, unfortunately I can't be there, but I've, I've got a little picture here of Adelaide um, to give you a little bit of an idea of the place. I'm not, it's not what Adelaide looks like just at the moment, obviously, because uh, actually it's a very sunny day, but it's my favourite picture of Adelaide. Um, and you can get a little bit of an idea of, of what the place is like. Um, see if I can bring up the actual talk. Okay, can you guys see the slides now? Yes, yes. Good. Uh, apologies if I keep asking you. Um, it's very hard to know exactly what you guys can see and hear. So if there is any problem, let me know. And um, hopefully I'll uh, notice before we've been going for half an hour or something like that. Um, the talk is uh, how I learned to stop worrying about traffic matrices. Um, it's uh, obviously mainly about traffic matrices, but I wanted to weave a little bit of a story around that um, uh, talk about traffic matrices and to make a few bigger points about um, network modeling in general as well. Um, the talk is really not just about my work. It's about a whole lot of people uh, I've worked with and I've listed a good number of them there, but I'm sure I've missed some people. Um, and in particular, people like Albert Greenberg um, really set me on the path of thinking about traffic matrices and Yin Zhang and Paul Tune and Walter Willinger and so on have been wonderful collaborators over many years. So I certainly don't want to take credit for all of the work I'm going to talk about here, um, but you can blame me for anything that's a bit boring or bad. So feel free. Um, the other thing I want to say right at the outset is that I'd love it if you guys ask questions. Uh, the, the one problem is I don't know if I'm going to hear very easily when you do ask questions. So perhaps pass your questions to someone at the front and and just interrupt me because um, I can't see you very well if you've got your hand up or if you just say something quietly at the back there. Um, but please do ask questions. Um, so without let's start talking about the work. Um, there's a few references you can use. There's obviously uh, many papers on traffic matrices, um, but Paul Tune and I tried to summarize a large amount of that in the SIGCOM ebook a couple of years ago. Um, so there's a chapter which covers a large part of the material I'm going to be talking about today. Um, it has a lot of the background material and it goes into a lot more detail than I can go into in a, a three hour talk. So if you're interested in this work and if you're interested in going further, I recommend that you have a look at that. Or if there's anything that I say that's confusing and you want to think about it a bit more afterwards, again, have a look at that. But we are going to go a little bit beyond the work that's in that chapter into some of the newer stuff that we've been doing the last couple of years as well. Uh, it's my web page. Uh, the slides will be available um, off that web page. Uh, I haven't actually put them up yet. Um, I usually wait till afterwards in case uh, people notice any mistakes or any anything that could be improved in the slides, uh, but they should be up there by tomorrow. Um, there's also a page on traffic matrices, and, and there's a little bit of data hanging off that page. One of the big problems in this domain is getting data, um, and the, the really big problem is getting data that can be made public. Almost no ISPs want to share their data with the general research community. So we have very small amounts of, of publicly shared data, but I have some links to that off this page. So okay, a little bit about myself and about um, how I think about uh, modeling and how I think about problems. Um, I, I started out in Adelaide. I, I grew up here. Um, and Adelaide uh, is a bit of an out-of-the-way place. It's a long way from anywhere, even in Australia. I think we're roughly 
800 kilometers from the nearest you know, really big city. Um, and uh, we do have direct international flights. But uh, if I was going to go to Belgium, I think I have to get on one, two, three, four planes, four legs. Uh, so it's not a bad thing for me to be able to do the talk this way. Um, Adelaide is a bit off the thing. Um, I did my PhD in queuing theory. Um, that was quite a long time ago now, uh, and uh, I, I come from a background where um, queuing theory was considered very important and it was a very big deal. Um, and then I went to work at at t Labs, and at the time, um, for me, at t Labs was, was kind of the mecca of queuing theory. It was, you know, Bell Labs, it was the home of a lot of the most famous people in queuing theory, and a lot of the biggest ideas in queuing theory. It's certainly one of the largest uh, network operators in the world. Um, and I turned up there with my PhD in queuing theory, and they, you know, they hired me, that was good, but when I got there, no one was interested in queuing. Um, and the, the basic story was the internet was starting, the internet was um, beginning, and a lot of the assumptions people had made in queuing theory were completely unrealistic. Um, so the problems that queuing theory was solving were not real problems. And even if they had been real problems, uh, no one had the data that you could have used to populate your queuing theory models. Um, so I ended up spending a lot of time almost relearning um, the sort of problems that people were interested in, and a big part of that was about traffic models. So um, we're going to talk a lot about traffic metrics in a bit. The thing that... Um, the thing that is... Uh, you know, perhaps interesting is that if you look back through the literature of network optimization over the last 30 or 40 years, there is an implicit assumption in all of that literature that a traffic matrix is an easy thing to get. And so you see this optimization literature, which is developed, and this queuing theory literature, which is developed, just assuming that data exists, assuming it's easy to get. And as it turns out, it's not. Um, and there's a lot of work that's gone into how we obtain traffic matrices and how we then have to use them. And that's what I really want to talk about today. So, an introduction. Firstly, what is a traffic matrix? Uh, can I, can I, I can't see guys very well, but perhaps I could get a quick show of hands of people who've uh, used traffic matrices or, or know anything about them. Um, I can't see anyone raising their hand. Is that fair? Okay, so um, that's good. That means I can uh, I can teach you my view of traffic matrices. You don't have any baggage. So traffic matrices. Uh, well, obviously it's a matrix. A, a matrix in uh, mathematics means just a, a 2D array of numbers. And the usual sense of this, and this is not the only way to think about a traffic matrix, but the usual sense of it is that it consists of elements telling you the amount of traffic going from some part of a network to some other part of the network. Now that's a pretty vague statement really, and I'm gonna talk quite a bit more about some of the details of what it means to go from part of a network to another part of a network and so on. But that's the basic idea. And I've tried to illustrate that here with my matrix T, and TAB is the traffic going from A to B in the network. Well incidentally, uh, I've drawn a route for that traffic, but that route has nothing to do with the traffic matrix, not naively. That, that route is really just there for illustrative purposes. I said that from some part of a network to another part of a network is a really vague thing. Well, um, that's sort of deliberate because traffic matrices encompass a, a whole sort of range of um, types of actual matrix. Those locations in a network, they could be physical locations, they could be routers, or they could be links, or they could be servers, or they could be what we would call a point of presence, which roughly corresponds to, say, a metropolitan area in a large network operator. Um, but they could also be logical locations. So they could correspond to particular IP addresses, or they could correspond to prefix blocks. 
Um, there are no doubt lots of other things you could incorporate in here, but they're the, the common senses. And perhaps the most common is to talk about router to router traffic matrices, but there are good reasons why that's not necessarily the best um, level to think about them. Um, there are a lot of other distinctions. So uh, traffic matrices, we start talking about um, in here are often what we would measure on a network. So I would call that the carried load on a network. It's the load, the traffic that's actually carried across the network. But we could also talk about the offered load. That's the amount of traffic that people wanted to send across the network. And you could form a traffic matrix like that. But we would often call that a demand matrix, not a traffic matrix. Now, um, I'm going to talk about these sort of little issues quite a bit, but in a lot of the literature, out there, they almost assume that they're the same thing. And they're not necessarily. Likewise, there is a very important distinction between what I would call an ingress egress traffic matrix and an origin destination traffic matrix. So uh, when you when you look at the literature, a lot of people will talk about origin destination traffic matrices. And this is the thing that everyone wants to study really at the basis. It's the traffic going from its actual origin, say my computer, to its actual destination, which might be you guys um, over in Belgium. So that's an origin destination traffic matrix. Um, but despite the fact that almost all the research literature talks about origin destination traffic matrices, almost no one looks at them. Um, almost all of the research literature is actually looking at what I would call ingress egress traffic matrix, and I'm going to talk about that quite a lot. So I'm not going to jump the gun here, um, but we will come back to that distinction um, in a few places. Let's go back quickly to offered versus carried load. Offered load is the potential traffic. It's the desire. It's the what people would like to put onto the network. Carried load is what we actually see. Obviously, they can be different. Um, so I'm sure a large number of you know about congestion controls. I thought one of the other talks over this week is going to be on TCP, but um, ultimately what can congestion controls do is limit the amount of traffic that can go over a particular route through a network. Um, so they often involve some sort of form of feedback. Um, and that can limit the amount of traffic that you see compared to the carried load. But there are lots of other um, reasons why offered load and carried load can be different. One of them um, uh, might be content distribution networks which shift load around in the network. They shift, effectively, they shift destinations. Um, another thing uh, might be an anomaly in the network. You might have some sort of problem in the network which distorts the traffic. Um, we would like to know about observed uh, offered load. We'd like to understand offered load, but we don't observe it. We don't see what's offered. What we see is what's carried. Um, so often we hope that they'll be very similar. We hope that congestion won't cause big differences. We hope that there aren't too many anomalies or problems in the network. But um, ultimately, we never get to see the thing that we would really like to see. That's important, OK? Now, um, it's important for a reason that I want to try and describe to you. It's a sort of mathematical reason, but um, it's why traffic matrices are interesting. What we would really like to study when we're looking at networks, what we really care about is what I would call an invariant. An invariant is something that doesn't change when we change the network. The reason we need invariants is because if we're going to plan changes to the network, we need to plan them based around something that isn't going to just change when we change the network. So when I add an extra link to my network, or if I add extra capacity to my network, I would like the traffic matrix not to change. Now, the offered load, the offered load is much closer to being a true invariant than the carried load. And you can see that easily if you think about congestion. When I increase the capacity of a link, the congestion might go away. 
And when the congestion goes away, the offered load and the carried load look close together. So the carried load is not a true invariant. But again, and just to repeat this, this is the problem that we often face in mathematical modeling, in particular in modeling the internet. We don't get to observe the thing that we would like to observe. Um, so we typically observe a carried load and we hope that that is invariant under some set of proposed changes to our network. Um, here's an example when that fails. So um, it's a cartoon example. It's not a real network. It's not anything. It's just designed to illustrate this. And I based it on Australia, but you could see the same thing happening anywhere else in the world. Perth is on the west coast of Australia. Sydney's on the east coast of Australia. So I've got two autonomous systems, two network operators here, ASX and ASY. Um, and I have some traffic originating in Perth, and it's going to Sydney. But it's originating in Perth on ASY, and it's going to Sydney on ASX. So it has to transit between the two. So how do we do that transit? Well, the classic uh, approach is to use what's called hot potato routing. And people who've studied a bit of BGP will know this, uh, but in case you haven't, the idea of hot potato routing is that you dump the traffic off your network as quickly as you possibly can. You treat it like a hot potato. Uh, I, I don't know whether you guys play this game in Belgium, but in, in Australia, the idea of a hot potato is like a party game when you're in, in kindergarten. You have this thing that you pass around, and when the music stops, whoever's left with the hot potato is out. Uh, so that's the idea of hot potato routing. You get rid of the traffic as, as quickly as you can. And it makes economic sense because... Um, traffic costs you money. Carrying the traffic across your network costs you money. So you get it off of your network and onto someone else's network as quickly as you possibly can. Okay, so that's the idea. It seems really unfair. It seems like sort of cheating, but the reason it works out to be fair is your um, partner, ASX, will do the same thing to the return traffic. And so as long as you have a roughly symmetric balance of traffic between you two guys, um, there'll be a degree of fairness in this strategy. Um, problems with this. What are the problems? Well, um, what happens if I remove one of these links? Now, one of the things I could normally do but is a little bit harder to do here is um, take out one of the, draw one of those links being taken out, one of these guys. I don't think you can see my cursor, can you? Um, take out one of these links, and then you see all the traffic reroutes. Now, if I'm only observing um, the ingress, egress traffic on my network, if I can only see... Um, ASY, for instance, that change, that loss of a link, will change the ingress-egress traffic matrix. So you can see that changes in the network um, can result in changes in the observed traffic, the ingress-egress traffic, the carried traffic on the network. So it's not a true invariant. And this is a problem for us. Um, there are some ways of dealing with that, and, and hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit about how we deal with that particular issue, but it's very complicated. And um, in general, the internet is not just two networks, it's a very large number. Um, if we count by autonomous systems, there's tens of thousands of networks, but actually it's much worse than that. Autonomous systems are a very crude measure of the number of, um, think of them as ISPs or network operators out there. Um, and there are all sorts of different variants in the way they connect together. It's not just hot potato routing. Um, in fact, some people do what's called cold potato routing, which is almost the opposite thing. So um, given these sorts of complexities and given the fact that um, as, a, as a network operator or as a researcher, I can probably only see one network, uh, we're always going to be in this domain where we have a limit to what we can do with traffic matrices. 
Um, but they are important and they are necessary in order to do any planning at all. So the story is not all bad. I'm going to get to the story of uh, the good bits of traffic matrix measurement and estimation in a bit. But I want to show you what happens first when people just throw their arms in the air and say, oh, it's too hard. I can't do this. I can't work out traffic matrices. I can't plan my network. This is what happens. Uh, this is a real picture. This is a picture of a town called Pratt in Kansas in the USA around 1900. And I guess it's probably a little hard for you guys to see on your screen there. But all of those white lines, all of that stuff are wires. And this is because network operators were just stringing wires up willy-nilly everywhere to try and connect everyone up to the telephone. Um, so that's the sort of thing that happens if you don't plan at all. You end up with crazy, crazy network designs. So what do people do with traffic matrices? I have a little list here. I'm sure it's not complete, but it will give you a bit of an idea. Um, and I want to talk about some of these in a little bit more detail later on. But to give you an idea, perhaps the biggest application I should say, I'm going to divide this into two groups. I'm going to talk about what network operators do with traffic matrices, and then I'm going to talk about what researchers like you and I do with traffic matrices. Um, network operators want them to actually help plan their network. They want to improve their network. And the, the classic task that they would be looking at is network planning, by which I mean optimizing your network. And this can be broken into several different little subtasks, uh, capacity planning. Capacity planning is working out where I should put my links and how much capacity those links should have. And that's an obvious job. Um, we could also talk about um, traffic engineering. So traffic engineering is a very similar task, but the, the difference is that when I'm doing capacity planning, I'm assuming that I can build out new links. And I'm assuming that I can add new routers into my network. When I'm doing traffic engineering, I'm trying to optimize my network in the short term. So perhaps I'm trying to optimize it for tomorrow or for next week. And I can't build out new capacity in that amount of time. Typically, um, when I was at at and certainly, and I think this is true of most network operators today, they still operate in terms of building new capacity in terms of months or even years. And the reasons for that are not technical so much as business. Businesses need to plan around budgetary cycles. So you don't get people suddenly saying, I've got a new bunch of money this week, I'm going to build a new network. They have to justify the expenditure, explain how it's going to be used, and then get it ratified, and then they go out and spend the money and build it. So capacity planning might take months. What do you do in the short term if something is going wrong, if you've got congestion? Well, that's traffic engineering. You try and fiddle with your routing. You try and fiddle with how the traffic is balanced across the network in order to better optimize your network without necessarily changing actual capacities. So those are classic network planning tasks. Both of them need a traffic. And uh, for those of you who come from an optimization background, you'll know this very well. Um, but you know there are there are half a thousand papers written about network planning, and um, almost all of them require a traffic matrix as, as an input. I would be lying if I said all of them. There's actually a stream of research called oblivious design where traffic matrices aren't needed. But I'm I'm not going to get too much into oblivious design here. I might go back and talk about it a little bit later on, just a little bit. Um, what else do we do with traffic matrices? Well, um, another task that I think is very important and highly underrated at the moment is what I would call network reliability analysis. I only know a few network operators who do this. Um, classical reliability analysis is all about graph theory. So when we talk about a graph, it's a mathematical construct describing where the links and nodes in our network are. And People in graph theory would talk about the network as being K-connected or K-edge connected. And a K-edge connected network is a graph where everyone stays connected even if we lose K edges in that network. So obviously, uh, sometimes links fail. Sometimes someone runs a backhoe uh, back through a um, uh, 
fiber and cut some logs. It says some very famous incidences of this happening. Um, and, and the one I, I remember off the top of my head is uh, a few years ago, there was a woman in the Ukraine who was uh, harvesting copper. And the way you do this is you go and dig up some copper cables in the ground and then you go and sell the copper. It turned out she dug up some live cables and carted them off to sell them. Only they were the cables that connected Ukraine to the rest of the world. And so she partitioned the network and people in Ukraine for some time couldn't connect to the internet, not the wide internet. Um, there are lots and lots of examples of this. It's a very common occurrence. If you run a network operator, you'd be amazed how often someone cuts one of your cables carelessly. Um, and then sometimes network operators have to deliberately um, take one of their links down. Sometimes network operators have to do maintenance. Um, so in those cases, they might deliberately take that link down and they want to be able to plan for that link going down. So traditionally in graph theory, we would plan by saying, well, if I take that link down, the network is still going to be connected. The network will still work. Okay. Um, but that's not enough. Okay, so if I take a link down, the traffic will be rerouted off the alternate routes. And that rerouting may overload them, may cause congestion. And during that congestion event, my customers may get very unhappy. So good network planning, planning for outages, planning for problems, involves not just checking that your network is going to be connected after a failure, but also checking that you will have sufficient capacity. Now, I have, I have another good example, and I, I probably, um, uh, no, I shouldn't tell you this example, perhaps, but it's from a long time ago now, um, and it, we, we won't say which network operator this is from. It's a network operator I did some reliability planning um, with a group of people for, and we had a look at the network and we said, you know, if this link fails, if this particular very big link, and I think it was a link between Chicago and New York fails, then there's going to be problems in the rest of the network. All that traffic between Chicago and New York is going to get shunted over to um, one alternate route, and that alternate route will suddenly become hopelessly congested. So we suggested some um, OSPF weight changes. And by changing the shortest paths, you can also change the shortest paths after a failure. And you can set things up so there will be a better balance of traffic after that failure. So what happened two weeks later? Two weeks later, that link actually failed. Um, and uh, apart from the network operator coming and asking us where we were the day it failed, um, we got a lot of brownie points. We got a lot of kudos for that particular case because the network operated perfectly. Even though that very big link had failed, none of the customers even knew it. So that's network reliability analysis. Again, to do network reliability analysis, you need a traffic matrix and you need the traffic matrix, not the link loads. And the reason you need the matrix is because you can't tell from the link loads where the traffic will go in a failure. You need to know where the traffic comes from, where it's going to, in order to know how that traffic will be rerouted. So that's a, another big example of, of traffic metrics um, applications. And the last one, and this has been a popular research topic, um, I don't think it's done as much in network operators as uh, researchers, researchers would like to think, but it's a it's another potential use of traffic matrix, which is to look for anomalies. And here, by anomalies, we 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 associate unusual events in traffic with problems in the network. And obviously, you'd like to detect problems as quickly as possible. Now, all of these network operations tasks, all of these network operations tasks need a real traffic matrix, a real matrix for my network, for my network tomorrow or in some time in the future. They need a prediction of the traffic. And the fact that it's a prediction is important because predictions always have errors. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. Predictions of traffic matrices always have errors. We also need traffic matrices that are real and specific to our network. Um, we don't want a generic model of a traffic matrix. We want our network. 
So that's what network operators like. On the other hand, researchers who want to work with traffic matrices, um, they're usually doing um, a couple of different related tasks. They're looking at designing a new protocol. Classic might be a new routing protocol. Or they're looking at designing a new algorithm, let's say a new network optimization algorithm, a new capacity planning algorithm. And they want to know how well that algorithm will work. In order to know how well it works on realistic data, you need a realistic traffic matrix. But they don't need a real traffic matrix. And this is an interesting point, and I'm going to come back to this definitely before the end of the presentation. They don't need a real traffic matrix. And what they need is an ensemble that's a group of traffic matrices that are perhaps realistic, but more important is that they're controllable. We need to be able to set the parameters, set the meaning of the parameters. So let's keep these two sorts of applications in mind. They impose different restrictions on what we're going to do, and we're going to focus perhaps more on network operations for the first half of today, and then we're going to talk more about research and how we can generate ensembles of traffic matrix in the second half of the talk. Um, I want to give you a very, very rough history of traffic matrix research as, as we go along. And part of the reason I want to do this is because internet traffic matrices don't exist in, in a vacuum. Um, the idea of traffic and traffic matrices goes back a long way. The first paper I know of um, that talks about traffic matrices is in the context of the telephone, and the telephone network by a guy called Krufoff. Um, I'm probably mispronouncing that name terribly. If someone, uh, someone uh, um, from a more German background can tell me how to, s to pronounce it, I'd be very happy. And in fact, if someone from a German background wants to translate this paper for me, I'd be very happy because the paper's written in German and no one's ever translated it. So um, I only know this work through second-hand sources. No volunteers? Maybe someday someone will translate it for me. Um, when we get to the 60s, uh, people started looking at traffic matrices in the context of transportation networks. By transportation, I mean cars and buses and trucks. These sort of networks with real physical um, you know, vehicles. Um, and that was a big topic in the 60s, and it still is now. And this transportation literature um, now looks at things like container traffic around the world. So this is a topic of research that's ongoing and roughly in parallel to some of the internet, um, internet traffic matrix work. But it is a little bit different. Transporting real physical things around is not the same as transporting packets. And so if I get a chance, I'll say a little bit about that as well. But you can imagine the difference. Um, Internet measurement, um, network tomography, this sort of area came up starting with Vardy in 1996. So the first paper um, by Vardy, which is called Network Tomography, actually doesn't deal with the topic that a lot of people talk about when they talk about network tomography today. Network tomography, often when people visualize it, they think of active performance measurement. And I'm sure you guys will hear some talks over TMA about active performance measurement and people will talk about tomography. The original context for it is in traffic matrix inference. And there's a reason for that. The two problems are actually dual problems. Um, so network tomography is the sort of general name for all of these suites of measurements. Um, I might tend to call it traffic matrix inference these days just to be clear about what we're talking about. Um, and then internet measurement. So internet measurement became a big thing. Um, started really in the 90s, but it became a big thing perhaps in uh, the early 2000s and on from there. And from my point of view, the reason, even though there were lots of people starting and researching network measurement in the 90s, the reason it became really big in around 2000 is because of the internet bubble and its collapse. So prior to uh, around 2000, um, the amount of money floating around to do anything internet-y was ridiculous. People would throw money at a project. 
Uh, people didn't do network planning. In fact, I've seen plans of networks that were drawn on the back of an envelope, literally. Um, I've seen people planning networks. The classic uh, way people talked about planning a network was, in, in North America at least, was the NFL cities. So the NFL cities, I don't watch American football, but I'm told the American uh, Football League, the cities are the biggest cities in America. So what you do is you take a map of America and you put a circle over each of the NFL cities, uh, except for Minnesota, which is the Green Bay Packers, which for some reason is not such a big city. Um, and then you draw lines between them. And this was literally how people did a whole lot of network design back in the 90s. Suddenly, after 2000, after 2001, there was this huge crunch, and suddenly people had to justify investments much, much more carefully. And so as soon as you have to justify invest investments more carefully, you have to do careful planning. And to do that, you needed to measure traffic matrices. So people like Anya Feldman stepped in and started measuring traffic matrices for real. Um, I came in about this point. It was a good point um, to jump in to this particular sort of topic. Um, okay. Between about 2002, 2010, there was a lot of work on internet demography. And so internet demography, you think of network traffic matrices on the internet. Um, and there was a whole lot of work. Um, it was almost like a leapfrogging between Sprint and at and and I'm going to talk a bit about why that happened as we go along. But um, I've got a list of papers here. It's only a partial list of papers. But you would see one paper in SICOM from the Sprint guys, and the next year there would be a paper from the at and guys, and then the next year there'd be a paper from the Sprint guys. And it was like we were leapfrogging past each other each time. Um, and that continued to perhaps 2010, perhaps a little bit earlier at stock. Um, at the same time, there was a lot of work starting in that sort of era about anomaly detection and some of the applications of these traffic matrices. Um, the other topic that I'm going to talk about today was traffic matrix synthesis. And um, the first paper I know of on traffic matrix synthesis, at least in the domain of internet measurements, was from 2005. Um, there were very few papers about it. Um, in fact, I only know of three papers up to now, four papers up to now that focus entirely on synthesis of traffic matrices. So it's an area of research, I think, that has a lot of potential um, for growth, and it's something that I want to talk about towards the end of today. So here's a quick outline of today's talk. Um, I can see that I'm already running a little bit behind my own schedule, so I might have to waffle a little bit less, but I'm sure that would be a good thing for you guys. Um, I have five topics here. I'm going to start with measurements. Obviously, TMA, guys, I'm, I'm assuming you're interested in network measurements. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about what the traffic matrices we know about look like. Um, they have some, some obvious patterns, and I want to highlight those. And then I want to talk a little bit more about applications again um, and highlight a few particular applications and talk about how we might apply traffic matrices and give you some examples, give you a bit more concrete um, work to go with. Um, and then I want to talk about synthesis. So this is really about what do you do um, when we don't have traffic matrices. So I'll just skip back all the way to the back of my slides, so excuse me for a sec. Okay. So first up, how do we measure a traffic? Okay. Um, I apologize to those of you who are experts on network measurement. I'm sure I'm going to overlap with a lot of the experience you already have. And I'm going to be talking about particular bits of technology that some of you probably uh, know more than I do about. But I have a particular, particular interest in these and a particular story I want to tell. So I apologize if I go into a bit more detail than is necessary for some of you, but I'm sure um, 
There's something I want to get to. So starting out, how do you measure traffic on a network? The ideal method or the method that um, I started doing and a lot of people started doing back in the 90s is to collect what we would call a packet trace. And there are lots of different ways we can do that. Um, the classic way of doing it with optical fiber is you put a splitter into the optical fiber and you can get very cheap splitters. They're just they're what we call brag grading and they'll split 10% of the light and you send that light to a monitor. And the monitor just records everything. Um, in fact, it records a little bit more than the traffic. It also records the timing of packet arrivals. Um, you don't have to record everything. And in fact, most people who are collecting packet traces wouldn't record all of the data in the packets. They would record just the headers. But, you know, there's an interesting uh, question of how deep into the packet you should go. Obviously, you want the TCP and IP headers, but uh, do you want to collect um, application headers? Do you want to collect, say, HTTP headers and so on? And obviously, that depends a little bit on what you want to do with it. If you're collecting a traffic matrix, then generally the TCP IP headers are enough. Generally. There are exceptions to that, but that's generally all we need. But that's a lot of data. Um, I've got a trivial example there of how much data we can generate with a packet trace. Um, ultimately, though, uh, internet measurement data was one of the first canonical examples of big data. It's one of the sources of data that you go back through the big data, big data literature, and you'll see that back in, uh, say, the, the late 90s, people were starting to form this idea of big data. Internet measurements was one of the examples they kept coming back to. And the basic idea of big data is that you collect data sets that are so big that you can never actually store them. You can never actually put them all into memory. And you can imagine back in 2000 that 10 gigabit per second of, of data was definitely big data. Today we might be able to cope with that, but imagine a thousand links like this. And a big network operator could easily have a thousand uh, times this sort of amount of traffic going across it. In fact, do I have a picture? Yeah, I do have a picture. This is the Australian traffic. And you know, um, this is a pretty rare view of a country. This is actually collected by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Um, and this is one of the best data sets. I'm sure it has problems in it. I'm sure it has some flaws. But it's one of the best nationwide sets of statistics for total traffic going across a country. Um, it tells us originally it was collected on a quarterly basis. Uh, for the last um, 10 or so years, it's been collected every six months. Um, and it tells us very broadly how much traffic um, went across Australian ISPs over that um, time period. Um, and I've been plotting this data for a while. You can see that it's been growing exponentially at least to a first order approximation. And it's been growing exponentially for a long time. We're looking now at 16 years, 15 years of traffic data. And you can see it fits a straight line on that long plot pretty well. Um, but more importantly, look at the, the scale. This is in petabytes per day. And we're generating something of the order today of 10 petabytes of traffic per day just in Australia. And Australia is a tiny place compared to anywhere, really. Uh, maybe not compared to um, some of the small European countries, maybe. But it's a pretty, pretty tiny place on the world scale. Um, back when I was at AT&T, AT&T's network carried a petabyte of traffic a day. That was one network in North America. One network in North America. And that was a good decade ago as well. So we're talking about very, very, very large volumes of traffic. So we are never going to be able to do this um, over all of the scope that we would like to be able to do. 
And that's just, that's even ignoring the cost of exploring the glitters in these monitors. And they're not that expensive, but when you multiply it by a thousand, um, it suddenly becomes expensive. We are never going to be doing this. We're never going to get our traffic matrices this way. So what do you do, what do you do when you run into a data set like this? How do you deal with such large volumes of data? Um, I think of four strategies. And these strategies are, you know, the, the current hype is big data. People talk about big data a lot. They talk about all the issues that go with it. But big data has been around for a long time. Big data just means data that's too big for me to deal with. So today, big data might mean terabyte or petabyte data sets. But back in the 90s, you only needed 100 gigabytes to have something that was utterly unwieldy. You couldn't put it in memory, um, and it was expensive to store and um, so on. So big data has been around, big data has been around forever, and statisticians particularly have been doing this for a long time. So there are roughly four strategies, sampling, filtering, sketching, and aggregation. Um, sampling is a standard statistical thing. It's been around for more than 100 years. Um, it's very well understood, very well known, and it's something that we do in the internet domain, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, as we talk about measurements. Filtering is another really easy to understand idea. Um, filtering is you only look at the packets that you want to look at. Um, it's a very useful technique, but it also has big limitations. The, the limitation is you have to know exactly what you want to look at up front. We often don't know that, and it's, so it's not as useful a generic technique. And I'm not going to talk too much about filtering today. Sketching is a big, big area. And it's, a, it's a topic that's really got some wonderful mathematics in it and some very, very cool algorithms. I'm not going to go into it today either. Um, it's a topic all of its own right. And, and for those of you who don't know anything about it, I recommend you go and dig up some of the literature about it. But I don't have time to do it justice today. And then there's aggregation. And aggregation is the other really major strategy we use with internet measurements. So the two things I'm going to talk about today are sampling and aggregation. There are all sorts of different strategies for aggregation, but the basic idea is to reduce the granularity of your data. So if you think about a packet trace, we're keeping one record for every packet. By reducing the granularity, I mean aggregating some of those packets together and recording information, one record of information about that grouping. And there are obviously different ways you can do the grouping, and the two classic ways of doing it are aggregating by time or aggregating over some sort of keys. And the two classic instances or examples of these two strategies are SNMP and NetFlow. So I'm going to talk a bit about SNMP and NetFlow um, as different alternative approaches to making network measurements. So let's start with net SNMP. Uh, SNMP stands for the Simple Network Measurement Protocol, so I should say. Simple Network Management Protocol, but it's used for measurement as well. In fact, I would argue that it's been used much more for measurement than it ever has been for management. Simple Network Management Protocol gives you a very simple means of collecting data from your network. So I've got a little graph there. It's just a graph generated by a tool called RRD tool, which is one of the classic SNMP collectors. Um, and it shows you the sort of thing you get. All this collection is telling me is telling me bits per second on a particular link, and it's telling me both directions, so the blue and green curve, so one shows outward and the other shows in. But it loses all detail. So um, SNMP doesn't tell me anything about what that traffic is. It just tells me how many bits there is. It's also quite coarse granularity. So the classic SNMP collection is at five minute intervals. And there's good reasons for it. Um, it's quite hard to collect um, data at high resolution. Um, and this is related to the errors in SNP, and I'm going to talk about them in just a second. SNP also suffers severely from missing data, and I'm going to give you some examples of that as well. 
Um, so just a general word on data quality. Um, this is my rant. This is the thing I do with all of my tunes. I talk about the problems in data and um, no one believes this. You tell someone about this and they say, no, my data is clean, my data is good. If you think your data is clean, you haven't looked at it. You haven't carefully debugged your data. I have never seen a data set that was truly clean. And every time I do this, um, the most recent example is a set of data from Australia's power network, which is a different thing altogether. But this is data that's used in billing. It's real data from the real power network, and it's based around real revenue power companies make. And we found all sorts of garbage on this data. Um, it's surprising to me, again, uh, at one level that you would see problems in the data set, but another level, I know this. Every time you look at a data set, there are problems on it. Broadly speaking, there are five categories of problems. There are numerical errors, and these are just uh, noise. I would call them noise. They're in every data set. They're not usually a huge problem. Um, however, you should know how big the noise in your data is. Um, and this is a process we call calibration. <laughs> in any area of science or engineering, if you were going to build a measurement apparatus, one of the first things you would do with that apparatus is calibration. For some reason, in internet measurement, we don't do it. I don't know why. If someone can tell me why, I'd love to know. But calibration is a fundamental metrology sort of task. It's a fundamental task whenever you want to make measurements. But these sort of numerical errors, ultimately, they're not the biggest problem. Bigger problems are things like artifacts. So by artifacts, I mean places where the data is just really garbage. Classic examples of that are where someone has been smart and they decided to help you by putting something like NA, not applicable, into a data form. Now that might be helpful, except if that then gets written by another system that refuses to read the number. And who the hell knows what happens there? Um, classic example, another classic example is someone will put um, formatting into numbers. They'll put commas into numbers. And again, some software that tries to read that will then interpret that badly. Uh, another example that I've seen is two processes tried to write to the same file at the same time and overwrote each other, or a process crashed partway through writing a data. Now, these are all problems that people in the database community know how to fix. Okay, so these are problems that are not research topics. They're something that we know how we could fix. But, and this is a, another general rant, people implementing um, measurement software often don't know this stuff. And that's because measurement software, particularly the measurement software that's been built into routers and built into vendor devices, has often been added as an afterthought. It's not considered the main purpose of that device. And so this measurement stuff gets glued on afterwards. And as a result, it's buggy and uh, sometimes badly thought out. So expect your data to have artifacts. Also expect that your data will have missing data. Um, this is again true of every data set that I've ever looked at. Um, it varies in how bad the missing data is. For instance, in the power data we've been looking at, it's about half a percent of the data. In some of the SNMP data sets I've looked at, it's as big as 20% of the data. And there are lots of different reasons for it. Um, but the classic reason is the monitor that collects the data has gone offline. And um, it's very rare, for, it's very common for people to build redundant software systems for network management, but it's very rare that they will build redundant software systems for network measurement. And so when something goes offline, you just miss that. It's not a big problem if it's a small amount. It's not a big problem if it's not correlated, but often it isn't tiny and often uh, it is correlated. And so you need to do some sort of interpolation to fill that data in. Now, again, if you think you don't need to do this, if you think you don't need to worry about missing data, then you're probably doing some form of interpolation by accident. And I've seen this happen plenty of times where people 
um, sort of ignore the missing data and they treat it like zeros or they treat it like the average or they just do something dumb and they don't know there's a problem. They don't understand that there's something going wrong and it can distort your analysis. And I've seen a couple of egregious cases where an entire analysis is really just wrong because they've treated missing data badly. Um, then there are some other problems that are um, issues when you start to do things like combine databases. And you might say, why am I going to do this? So I'll explain why we need to do it a little bit later. But in order to create a traffic matrix, at the very least, we need to combine traffic data with network topology data, network routing data. And those two data sets often don't have the same underlying assumptions. They have different keys, they have different formats, they have different structures. And this can make your life hell when you start trying to combine traffic data. And then there's ambiguous data. Sometimes people will give you some data, but they won't tell you something that you need in order to be able to interpret it. And I'm sure you can imagine cases where that might happen. So I just wanted to give you some real examples of this. And I think one of the things I've done, I've given quite a few talks about traffic matrices in the past. One of the things I haven't often had is a really clear example of some of these problems. And so I did a little bit of work a few years ago just to get uh, a set of data where I had at least roughly calibrated the results. And these are roughly calibrated. I won't go into the details of it because it's not too important for what I'm saying today but I want to give you an idea of the sorts of errors we see. So this is a plot I would call a CCDF. It's a complementary cumulative distribution function. So if you imagine a point, and I wish I had a pointer that you guys could see here. You guys really can't see my cursor, can you? Okay, so um, imagine a line going out from 10 to the minus 2 on the y-axis to 10 to the minus 2 roughly on the x-axis. If we had a point there, it says that roughly 1 in 100 measurements has a relative error of about 1%. So if you look at this S&P data, the actual data is the blue line. Um, you can see that um, perhaps 1% of the data has an error a little bit more than 1%. That's what I would call noise. And that's not too bad. 1% error over 99% of your measurements. Most people would be reasonably satisfied with that for the sorts of applications we care about here. Um, the really bad problem here, though, is right down here in the tail. Um, so look down how we have this nice curve that's dropping away, and then suddenly it flattens out. That tail follows a power law. Now, um, I don't have enough data, I don't have enough results here to trace that power law for long enough to call it a Pareto distribution or one of those sorts of distributions. But I did a little simulation of this and that generated this dashed red curve and you can see it fits pretty well down in this tail. The problem with that tail, you can see that um, it's pretty rare that we have measurements out in that tail. It's less than one in a thousand of the measurements, but the errors in that one in a thousand are huge. So right down out in this extreme end of the tail, we have some errors that are happening perhaps one in every few thousand measurements, but the error is around 100%. Let me just sink in. That means plus or minus 100%. What I can say about that is if you don't deal with that error, then you will produce analyses which could be completely wrong, particularly if you're doing something like anomaly detection, particularly if you're doing anomaly detection. Um, but certainly for things like, for instance, network planning. Imagine this error, this 100% error is used in my network plan. Then I could easily be doubling the amount of capacity that I need in my network. That would be crazy. What do network operators do about this? Well, the classic thing network operators do about this is what they call 95th percentile planning or 95th percentile billing, and they actually cut this distribution off around the 95th percentile, which is somewhere around here, 
I guess you guys can't see it. It's somewhere about the point where the red line and the blue line start to diverge. And they use that as a measurement of peak load. Now, the reason they do it is because of this horrible tag. Um, you talk to network operators and their reasons are not quite so carefully um, measured, but ultimately the rationale is the same, that they want to avoid this horrible tail in the errors in the measurement. Um, 95th percentile billing, by the way, is not necessarily the best thing to do, but it does get rid of this error. Okay. So what does it tell you? Well, I've got a simulation there and I've got the details of the simulation here. I don't really want to go into that simulation in too much detail. I want to give you a more intuitive understanding of how SNMP works and how that affects your errors. And the point of talking about SNMP is not because I don't think you guys know about SNMP. I'm sure that at least some of you know more about SNMP than I do. It's, it's years since I've gone out and written a poll on myself and actually done this. But how the polar works is really important for understanding these errors. So the way SNMP works is you have a network management station and it sends a poll, a request to a router or some other internet device and the router sends back some data. So this is the first important thing. It's a polling mechanism. So that has implications for timing. What time did I collect this measurement? Did I collect this measurement when I sent the poll out or did I collect it when I received it? Actually, the measurement is from some time in between, but the router doesn't tell me what time it was collected. The network management station knows when it sent the poll and it knows when it received the poll, but it doesn't know when it was actually collected. Now, most of the time, the difference between the, the, the two times is small, and so that's fine. But actually, there are times when these two can be uh, much further apart. Then you add to the fact that network management systems have often been implemented really badly, and the time that they record doesn't necessarily have anything to do with either of those two times. And this sounds crazy, but um, what they often do is they record the time that you scheduled the poll to happen. That's the time that I wanted to make that poll, not when it actually happened. Now, you can imagine that you could hope that the two things would be the same, but imagine if you're polling 10,000 devices. You can imagine that by the time you get to the 10,000th one of those devices, you've actually been going for some amount of time, minutes, in fact. And so the, the time that you think you're measuring at can be different from the time the measurement actually happened by a substantial amount. Again, this is a problem with the way things are implemented, but it's also a problem with the mechanism that SNMP uses to collect the measurements. So there's a fundamental component to it that contributes to the noise, contributes to these errors that we saw here, contributes to the body of this curve, it contributes to this top part. Okay, what else can happen? Well. SNMP does not tell you how much traffic was on the network. What it gives you when you receive your data back is just a counter, and it's like the odometer in your car. It just tells you how many miles have gone past, how many miles have you driven, how many bits have gone along an edge. So if you look at the counts from an SNMP counter, they go up, and you can imagine these poles going along in series, but what happens when you hit the top? What happens when you hit the maximum number? It wraps around. Um, in the original SNMP, in SNMP version 1 and version 2, these counters were 32 bits. 32 bits sounds like a lot, but the maximum 32-bit number is around 4 billion. And it's very easy to have 4 billion bytes go across your network in a very short amount of time. So these wraps could happen quite quickly. In fact, in the early SNMP counters, these wraps could happen multiple times between one pole. And then you would just get garbage out of SNMP. So that's a simple example of where you see artifacts. But actually, there's a lot more cases which are just corner cases in the way this protocol works. And the classic sorts of things are what happens when the router goes down and comes up? What happens if it goes down and comes up in between poles? These things can generate um, non-sequential counts. And the network management system doesn't know this. So the network management system will just present that to you as if it's real. 
and these can form artifacts. And like I said, there are all these other causes of artifacts when you have um, measurement stations writing to data and when this is a distributed problem. Once you understand this though, once you understand that SNMP works this way, once you understand that it has these sort of errors, I think you treat it a bit differently. And one of the problems that I've seen in the research literature on traffic matrices is a lot of the traffic matrix literature ignores this tail. It, it pretends that SNMP network measurements are perfectly accurate. The other thing that a lot of the literature ignores is correlations in errors. So this is a plot that's designed to show you where those big errors occurred. And um, this is a set of links. This is actually from Abilene, Abilene traffic matrices. So this is a set of, sorry, I should say traffic matrix elements. So for instance, the first line is the traffic from Atlanta to Houston. And it just shows you the scale of the errors. And the thing I want you guys to see here is that the big errors are really correlated. You can see these vertical lines almost through the data. And that means that we're getting a whole bunch of errors that are actually lined up together. Now that's the worst possible case for most inference algorithms. What you would like is um, small errors that are uncorrelated and randomly spread through the data. And what we have here is large errors that are highly correlated. And that just blows out of the water a lot of traffic matrix inference algorithms. The other thing I want you guys to notice is that um, this is a plot of the missing data. And again, the missing data is correlated. And the reason it's correlated in this case is because this particular vertical line right around the middle is because the network management station was down. Um, here it was correlated because the Atlanta, Indiana versus and the Indiana versus Atlanta traffic was correlated. And so the missing data is missing together. You can see there's a burst of missing data here as well. So errors and missing data in SNMP are not good. They're not the way you would like them to happen. So processing, cleaning your data is a very important step. Okay, the other big problem with SNMP, and this is, this is the thing that most people in, in the research literature got excited about, was the fact that SNMP does not tell you a traffic matrix. So SNMP, what it tells you about is the amount of traffic on a link but it doesn't tell you where the traffic's coming from, and it doesn't tell you where the traffic is going to. So SNMP does not give you a traffic matrix. All it gives you is edge counts or link counts. What do we do about that? Well, this is the classic network tomography problem, and I've got a really simple cartoon version of it here for you guys. Um, and again, I'd love to have a pointer and a stick I could go through this with you, but ultimately the idea is that the traffic on each link is made up of the traffic that's routed across that link. So I've got a very simple cartoon here with three endpoints, one, two, and three, and one router in the middle, and I've made everything bidirectional to make it simple. Real traffic matrices, you have to deal with both directions separately, but just to make it really simple, I've made this um, as if direction doesn't matter. So I have three endpoints and I have three routes through that network. So my traffic matrix here is X. Now I've done something particular to this traffic matrix. I haven't, I haven't written it as a matrix. I've written it as a column vector. How do I do this? Well, all I do is I stack the matrix. I take the matrix I would have had, which said traffic from one to two, two to three, and so on, and I stack those numbers on top of each other in a vector. Um, why do I do it? Well, it's so I can have this neat, neat linear algebraic way of expressing um, relationships. The vector Y, this is the traffic on each of those links, and I've just labeled the links one, two, three by their end destination. So the green one over here is link one, and you can see that link one connects to destination one. So what do we know about this? Well, we know that the traffic on link one is made up of the sum of the traffic on route one and the traffic on route two. So in other words, y1 is equal to x1 plus x2. So I have three links, I get three equations. 
I write them all out in matrix form like this, or I can write them in the nice abbreviated matrix form y is equal to rx, where r is a thing I would call a routing matrix. Now, I've drawn the routing matrix for this problem down here. You can see it's a 0, 1 matrix. It's what we would call an incidence matrix, and it tells me which routes use which links. So it's very simple in this case. Okay, y is equal to rx. Um, if I measure y and I know r, then I can try and make an estimate of what x is. So does anyone want to suggest a way I could do that? This is the audience participation part of the day, so uh, shout out. I won't be able to hear you unless you talk loudly. How might I solve this? How might I work out X? Any guesses? So this is a set of linear equations. And this sort of equation is just the sort of thing we would solve using a little bit of mathematics called a matrix inverse. So I would just multiply both sides by the matrix inverse, and I get x is equal to r to the minus 1, 1. It's a really simple thing to do in this case. The difficulty is that I can't use that trick most of the time. And the reason I can't use that trick most of the time is because I've got this very, very simple network here where I have three measurements and three unknowns. But if I have more unknowns than I have measurements, this doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because it's what we call an ill-posed or ill-conditioned model. Under-conditioned model is another word for it. So what else goes into this? Uh, I've mentioned that we have stacked the traffic matrix to get a vector. I should also, also mention that the equation should look more like this because we have errors. I've already talked about those errors quite a bit, but we should probably explicitly model them in our mathematics. So the Z here is my little vector representing measurement errors. And as I just said, R is not a square matrix most of the time, so we can't just invert. Here's another little example to just illustrate that. Um, I have... Here I have a bunch of links and a bunch of routes and, and so on, but I've simplified it to say that actually in this network I only have one link that I'm measuring, and it's the link between my two routers. And I have two routes that go across that, and the traffic on that one guy is the sum of the traffic on routes one and two. Now the reason for this extra little example is just to give you a bit of intuition about the problem when we have more unknowns, so the x1 and x2 are my unknowns, than we have measurements. And the problem is that even if I know why, there's an infinite number of possible solutions that satisfy it. I could have x1 is equal to 0 and x2 is equal to y1. Or I could have x2 is equal to 0 and x1 is equal to y1. Or I could have anything in between. So there's actually an infinite number of solutions to this problem. And so somehow, somehow I need to guess which one of those infinite number of solutions is the right solution for my particular network. And that's the tomography problem in a nutshell. I have a lot more detail about routing matrices here, but I, I think I'm going to jump over this for the moment, and maybe we'll come back to it, because I, I know I'm running a little bit behind where I want to be here. And I want to talk about the general framework for how you solve problems like this. So um, how do we solve this problem in general? Well, we have a problem y is equal to rx plus z. z is measurement error. x is the traffic matrix. r is the routing matrix. And y are the measurements. So y, I know y, and I know r. But it's highly under constrained, so we need some way of pulling out the solution that I want to choose. And we do that by having um, what is variously being called a model or a prior model 
or side information. And there are lots of papers on this. There are, uh, you know, half a hundred papers on these sorts of problems. They almost all can be written in the following way as an optimization problem. We can write it as find the traffic matrix, that's argmin, that minimizes the difference between the measurement and the inferred measurement. So if you think about Rx, Rx is going to be, if I pick a particular traffic matrix, Rx is going to be my inferred link loads. So Y minus Rx is the difference between my real measurements and the inferred measurements. So I want to minimize this thing. But as I said, if I just do that, I don't have enough information to work out what to do. So then I have this extra little bit which brings in the model. And it brings in the model by minimizing the distance of my inferred traffic matrix X, the distance from that to the model. And I just used XM here to refer to the model. So this is a very general strategy. Um, and the bits, the moving parts, the things that you can play around with here are things like this lambda. Lambda is an arbitrary parameter and it trades off between the size of the errors and the model. So if you think your errors are really big, you make lambda really big. And, and if you think your errors are really small, you make lambda a lot smaller. But you wouldn't make lambda zero because lambda is the thing that brings in the model. You can also play with the models. And there is a whole bunch of different models people have proposed. And I'm going to talk about one or two of them today. Um, you can also use different norms and different distance metrics. For those of you who don't have a, a mathematical background, um, you don't really need to know too much about them to get started in this area. But ultimately, it's about um, the sort of space that you think is appropriate here. And we've, in our papers, argued that using a thing called the L2 norm makes sense for this part, and the kullback wiggler divergence makes sense here. Um, and there are reasons for that, but we won't go into that in too much detail here. I'm, I'm very happy to answer questions about it if anyone has them later on. Okay. So I mentioned that there were quite a lot of papers about this tomography problem. And one of the, one of the things I wanted to try and do today is not just talk about traffic matrices, but talk about network research in general and how we go about it, how we think about network research. And I thought that one thing that I can helpfully say for you guys is um, why did this happen? Why did we see a whole lot of papers about traffic matrices and their inference from SNMP data? Why was it a popular topic? So I have this Venn diagram. And my argument is that um, we can classify research work into these three categories. There's useful work. By useful, I mean it makes someone money, or it saves lives, or it, uh, often it's, in our domain, it saves money. So it's useful in some practical, tangible way. It has some social benefit, perhaps. When I'm talking about tractable, what I mean is that I can solve the problem. Okay, so we can imagine an infinite number of problems out there that we might like to solve. Um, it's quite hard to find um, solutions to a lot of them. And we tend to work on the problems that we know how to solve. Tractable is a bit of a rubbery term, though, because it depends on what you know, depends on your experience. So that circle is a bit rubbery around the edges, depending on your skills and your knowledge. But ultimately, we have to work on tractable problems. And then there are what um, I might call interesting problems or important problems. And they're problems that extend our knowledge. They're problems where if you work on that problem and you solve it, other people will be really interested. Other people will care about the solution. Now, um, almost all research, almost all decent research is in at least one of these categories. If you're outside of these three categories, give up. Okay, because what you're doing is silly. 
A uh, lot of research is in one or the other. A lot of the time I spent at at t for instance, we were doing useful work, but it wasn't that interesting. Most of my life I've been working on tractable problems. Every so often I branch out and I think, wouldn't it be great to solve the P is equal to NP problem? And I think about it for an afternoon and then I realise that I'm hopelessly out of my depth and I'm never going to solve it. The other, other classics are things like the, uh, um, the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So, you know, it's not a bad thing to work on intractable problems sometimes, but certainly most of what you work on has to be tractable or you'll never get anywhere. And then interesting and important problems. Um, you know, if you work on interesting problems, people will be interested. It's, it's self-defining. So what you would really like to do is work in the intersection of these three sets. The difficulty is it's really, really, really hard to find problems in this intersection. And most people don't even try. Uh, most people just pick a problem and work on it without even thinking about this. Um, I believe, and I think this is uh, easy to argue really, is the reason the traffic matrix network tomography work took off, the reason why there were lots of papers on it, the reason why people jumped onto it is because it sits in this middle zone. We were dealing with problems that were useful for network operators. They were tractable. We found ways of solving them. But they were also interesting. And the solutions that came out of it told us new things about traffic matrices. So this is my general message for today is to think about your research. Think about the problems you're working on and think about how they fit into this picture. And at the very least, I would encourage you to try and find problems that sit in the intersection between at least two of these domains. Okay. So if it was so good, why did it die out? Well, the reason it died out is because a new sort of measurement started to become popular, and that's generically called NetFlow, although NetFlow is actually a Cisco um, name for what we would more generically call flow-level measurement, but I can't help it. Everyone calls it NetFlow. Uh, I call it NetFlow. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit now, and hopefully I can get to the end of this little network measurement section before the... Um, before we have a break, but I am aware that we're coming up for our break time. So I'm not I'm going to keep us around for too much longer. Um, I'm not an expert on NetFlow, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time. Um, the basic strategy is, again, an aggregation strategy, but SNMP tried to aggregate over almost everything. It aggregated over what sort of traffic it was, and it aggregated over time, and it aggregated over where the traffic was going. So we lost a lot of information with that. Uh, sorry, we lost a lot of information with SNMP. NetFlow tries to keep a lot more information by aggregating at a much smaller granularity. And the classic form of NetFlow, this is what a lot of people would use, even though it's not the only form of flow level collection, is Cisco version 5, where you collect an aggregate based on a five tuple, a key which is the IP source destination protocol and the TCP source and destination ports. You also aggregate somewhat in time, um, and there's also a little bit more um, fudging around the edges of it. And I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here. It's not too germane to what I want to talk about. But ultimately, the important thing about NetFlow is that you keep the IP source and destination. So NetFlow keeps enough information to see a traffic matrix. So here is my little example network. This is, again, a bit of a cartoon network, but I've tried to illustrate here why NetFlow data is useful to us. So we imagine a network here. Um, I put prefixes for my destination. So these are prefix blocks, the slash 24s. For people who don't know what a slash 24 is, it's not really that important for this particular talk. All you need to think about this is the label for a destination. and um, I'm just going to measure the net flow on this incoming link. Now, in reality, if you were going to do me network measurements over your whole network, you want to do lots of other measurements. But for the sake of argument, let's just measure this one point. So um, this is my set of measurements. 
uh, I measure the ingress node, which is just um, router 4. I measure the source prefix. I measure the destination prefix. And I can measure these because the NetFlow records include the source and destination IP addresses, which I can aggregate up to prefix level. And then I've just here recorded the volume of that traffic. Now, NetFlow tells me more than that. NetFlow tells me bytes, it tells me packets, it breaks it down by port numbers and so on. But I don't care about all of that for the purpose of measuring a traffic matrix. So all I'm keeping here is the volume of traffic. And obviously, this would be measured over some time period. Again, I'm trying to simplify things down so I can explain what I mean really quickly. But, and this is the, this is the thing that um, throws a lot of people, and this is the reason why even though NetFlow measurements now are quite common, traffic matrices are still a relatively uncommon beast in network measurement. Um, when I measure a destination prefix, that isn't enough. And the reason for this is because I don't get to see a true origin destination traffic matrix. For my network, I get to see an ingress, egress traffic matrix. Now, when I measure at this point down here, I know the ingress node. I know the ingress node is four because that's the measurement. But the traffic, when it flows through my network, leaves the network at some point, and I don't automatically know that. And the reason I don't automatically know that is if you look here, I can get to 10.0.1 via node two, or I can get to 10.0.1 via node one. So why did it choose this egress point instead of this one? Well, it was a routing decision. It was a hot potato decision. I looked at these OSPF weights and I said, the fastest way to get this traffic off my network is to route it out through this egress point. So the egress node for this guy which is the other thing I need to form a traffic matrix, comes from topology and routing information. So in order to take NetFlow and create a traffic matrix, I need to measure the network topology and I need to measure the network routing. And that becomes a stumbling block for a lot of people. In fact, when I do this, this is really just a different way of writing out the traffic matrix. But I could also convert all of this now into matrix form. And this would form, this table would form one row of that traffic matrix with a little bit more aggregation. But the point I wanted to make is that you need routing data in order to construct that traffic matrix. Um, so NetFlow can be used to construct a traffic matrix. Um, but the other issue that comes in here, the other thing that happens is NetFlow aggregation is not enough data reduction. NetFlow data um, can still be very large data, can still be big data. And so we sample NetFlow data. And there's a couple of different ways of sampling NetFlow data, but ultimately this brings in statistics into the problem. And as my little um, article from the newspaper suggests, people are terrible at statistics. Many people are terrible at statistics, and you need to understand them. But I'm going to give another talk on, I think my other talk is on Thursday, just about statistics and network measurement. So I'm not going to go into any more detail here. But ultimately, um, these are things we have to do. OK. OK, why don't we start? Um, so I can get through. I try not to waffle this time. I try and be a bit more direct. And what do traffic matrices look like? Um, well, I simplified them a little bit when I was talking earlier. Um, often what we think about when we talk about a traffic matrix is a snapshot at one particular time. But traffic matrices have been talked about in all sorts of ways. Um, really, there is a temporal dimension, and there's also, think of two spatial dimensions. There's the source and the destination. Um, so we could represent that as a tensor, which is a mathematical way of saying a, a higher order array of numbers. But often what people do is they take those stacked traffic matrices at each time 
and they represent them as an, a much bigger matrix like this. So X1 would be the, the stacked traffic matrix at time one, and then X2 would be time two and so on. So sometimes when people say traffic matrix, this is the thing they mean, this big X here, um, rather than a single snapshot. Um, sometimes people include other dimensions. So sometimes there's some notion of traffic type, for instance. So we certainly could talk about a higher dimensional object. Um, the nice thing about this particular representation as X is that previous equation I was talking about Y is equal to RX still works here, but then you end up with Y being a matrix instead of a vector as well. Um, and a lot of the traffic matrix work has looked at these sort of things. Uh, particularly if you look at some of the work on um, PCA, Principal Components Analysis on Traffic Matrices, you'll see this sort of form of traffic matrix talked about a lot. Um, but I want to separate, um, for what I want to discuss, I want to separate out the temporal and the spatial aspects of traffic matrices. There certainly are relationships between the two, but um, if we try and get into all of that sort of detail, we get endlessly sort of bogged down. So we separate the temporal and the spatial components out, we can start to understand what these things look like. Um, the other thing to think about with traffic matrices is just units. Um, for instance, traffic matrices, I've talked about them as if they're numbers of bytes of traffic, which is pretty common, um, but you could also look at a traffic matrix, which is numbers of packets, or you could also look at a traffic matrix, which is the number of flows. Uh, but mostly bytes, mostly we look at bytes. And then there's the time interval that uh, people are looking at these things over because you never actually see an instantaneous traffic measurement. What you tend to see is an average over some time period. Five minutes is common. Five minutes is common because SNMP data is commonly collected at five minute intervals. Um, 15 minutes or 30 minutes is common and that's because net flow um, tends to be collected on longer intervals than SNMP, more like 15 minutes or 30 minutes, but NetFlow isn't necessarily, necessarily collected in nice time bins, so we have to extend it out. So 30 minutes or an hour might be common if you're using NetFlow data. So this imposes some limitations on the sorts of models and the sorts of measurements, sort of way you can use traffic matrices as well. Um, I don't think I've ever seen traffic matrix data at a finer level than five minutes. It's not to say it's impossible to do, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone collect it at finer than that sort of time interval. Let's look at the temporal patterns first. Um, this is data from a large ISP. I'll let you guess which one. And it's actually just one, it's the sum over one row of a traffic matrix. So it's not a traffic matrix, it's just one part of that traffic matrix. And that's just so that I can show it to you, because if it was a whole matrix, obviously, there'd be a whole lot of numbers here and we wouldn't be able to see anything. And I just want to show you one aspect of this, which is the temporal patterns. And I want to show you how strong they are. And so if you look at this graph, this shows the traffic, total traffic um, through a particular pop in um, this large network. Uh, each day of the week, and you can see there is a strong periodic pattern there, and that corresponds to what we would call a diurnal or a daily cycle uh, related to people getting up in the morning and going to bed at night. Simple as that. Uh, you notice also Sunday and into Monday, although you have to remember this data is actually collected in GMT. Okay, so this is something that um, lots of people don't think about when they're looking at data as well is what time zone is it collecting? This is uh, a common thing if you think about it is to collect everything in GMT or actually UTC is probably uh, what you should be doing. Um, so actually Monday here is really Sunday and Sunday here is really Saturday. Um, but this is the weekend, these two days that are a little bit lower and then we have five days during the week. Now you can see the pattern pretty clearly. Um, but the thing that's actually shown on this that makes it even clearer is there's actually two consecutive weeks plotted here. The first week is plotted in blue, and then um, the black dashed line is the second week, and you can hardly see that. And the reason you can hardly see it is most of the time it's sitting exactly on top of the blue line. There are a few places up in these peaks where it's a little bit different. And I can make that even more obvious by looking at this shaded region here, 
um, on Tuesday to Wednesday, I've blown up into a larger picture and you can see that the two weeks, the traffic on those two weeks, very closely related to each other. Okay, so there is a very strong temporal pattern here. It's cyclic. The cycle periods are 24 hours and one week. We know this. We know why it's cyclic, because people go to sleep and people get up in the morning. And people do different things on the weekend from what they do during the week. And so this pattern is very repeatable. It's not exactly repeatable, though. You can see there's some noise. And if you looked over longer time periods, there would be more noise. So we can use this pattern to perform prediction. Very good prediction, say, a day in advance. Not so good prediction six months in advance. But this sort of pattern is very, very useful to us. What's the story? Well, the story is even though this is made up of large numbers of individuals, each of whom we think of as random, we think of them as doing their own thing, their own thing changes every day. Uh, you might use the internet one day and then not use it at all the next day. The aggregate, the average, the sum or the multiplex result of all of that is a highly predictable um, grouping. Here's another example, um, and I use this example from Abilene, and I've used it a lot. Um, every person I ever showed this to now says, oh, that's a bit old, isn't it, 2004? Well, there's two reasons I use it. One, because there is just not very much public traffic matrix data out there. This is public. You can get hold of this yourself. But also, this is a data set that lots of people have used and studied. So it's one of those things where I think it helps with the reproducibility of research to reuse data sets. So one of the things you see in the internet measurement community is uh, yet another data set. So lots of people have an idea, an algorithm or a strategy or an analysis technique they want. And the first thing they do to test it is they go and collect their own data set. That's a great thing to do and it's lots of fun, but it shouldn't be the only thing you do. One of the things you should be doing is taking your idea and trying it out on one of the data sets that's out there. And for traffic measurements, there are quite a few data sets out there. Traffic matrices themselves, though, there aren't that many. So I keep coming back to this one. Um, this is just one element of the traffic matrix, the traffic, and it's again showing the two different weeks. And, and this time you can see some spikes in the data. And those spikes, um, in this case, I believe they're real, they're not artifacts. Um, they show one of the other phenomena we often see in network data of unusual events occurring. And there's all sorts of reasons for these. And, and people talk about things called flash crowds or um, the slash dot effect is one of the things people used to call in a technical term for it might be a thing called a focused overload, where you have a focus of a lot of people who all, all jump on a bandwagon all at once. And that can actually be big enough to cause a, a spike in traffic. Um, perhaps the one I saw in, in real data that was um, uh, most surprising to me at the time, but obvious afterwards, and I kicked myself about it, was I was looking at some data from a particular company, and I noticed one day of the year their traffic went up by about four or five times what their normal traffic was. And I was convinced this was an artifact in the data, so I went and I had a look through the data, and I was trying to work out what could have cause this artifact to make this huge spike and uh, work out if I could just take it out of the data. Um, so it turns out this spike um, was on February 14th and the company in question was an electronic greeting cards company. And so I would have been a complete idiot if I tried to remove that. It was real. It was a real spike and it was because that business spiked on February 14th, Valentine's Day. Um, so, um, this is the same data over a much longer time period to give you an idea of how regular that pattern is over longer time scales. And you can see some problems. You can see, obviously, the big chunks of missing data here. Um, and again, as I said, missing data is endemic in these data sources. And you can see there, there's a couple of weeks data missing all at once. That's terrible. That's awful for doing a lot of things. You can also see that even though there is a very regular pattern over a couple of weeks, that pattern changes over time. And there are longer term trends and there are longer term behaviors that happen over that time interval. 
So what do we do to model it? Well, this is my favorite model. It's my hobby horse, so don't go away thinking this is the only way you can do it. But um, this is a very simple model that incorporates all of the things that I've talked about here. It incorporates a long-term traffic trend, such as we saw in the Australian traffic data, where you have this exponential growth over years. It includes what we call a seasonal component, which just means it's cyclical. It doesn't mean it's a yearly season. It doesn't mean summer, winter, um, autumn, all that kind of stuff. It, it means it's, uh, it could be daily, it could be weekly and so on, but it's that cyclical component. It in includes some random fluctuations and those, I would call them normal fluctuations. I call them normal for two reasons. One is because they're typical. They're not, they're usual. They happen all the time. And the other reason is because we would typically model these using a normal distribution or a Gaussian process. Um, so we would often call WT something like white Gaussian norms because we would model it that way. It's not the only way you could model it. Then finally, there's a component which I would call an anomaly component, and this is the spikes. These are these spikes you see that happen from time to time. Um, once I have these longer term predictable components, I can form a long term prediction of the mean, and then my traffic is just the mean plus the noise, and I've scaled this part of the noise by the mean, and in particular by the square root of the mean, and a parameter I call the peakedness. Um, and I should say I didn't come up with this model. Pe other people have called this the Norris model. It comes from a sort of standard time series literature. And the reason we have a square root of M in here is because it is consistent with the way traffic multiplexes. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go into multiplexing and, and, and this, but multiplexing is really just what happens when I take multiple traffic streams and I put them together. When I do that, the relative, the mean and the relative variance change. Obviously, I put more traffic together, the mean's going to be different. This is the way that the aggregation works when I take that model and aggregate it. And this works consistently with the parameter estimates I might predict if I were going to say, I'm just going to multiplex these, what would the traffic look like? And that consistency is one of the things I look for in a model. Um, what do we do with this model? Well, its first job is to estimate it. Um, I'm not going to spend time today trying to go into how you would estimate it, but I have a couple of papers written about that and they're referenced um, here. Uh, and uh, in that tutorial I mentioned um, at the start. Um, but the first job is estimating this, and there are some pretty standard time series techniques for doing that. Um, you do have to have a little bit of care, and it's not quite easy to just chuck a black box at this and get the results out. And, and the reason for that is, is these impulsive anomalies. They do make your life a little bit trickier than standard time series, but it's not, it's not really hard stuff, really. So estimation is not too hard with this model. Once I've estimated, I can do things like prediction. So what I've done here is the blue curve is real Abilene data and the green curve is the model that I've estimated from. And you see things about this. So firstly, I picked out the spikes. These asterisks, these red asterisks show the spikes that I pulled out of it. You can see that the model fits the data reasonably, but it does smooth the data. It smooths out some of that noise. And that's a good thing. Because that noise is not something that we typically care about in terms of long-term planning. Um, it's also not predictable. It tends to have perhaps long-range correlations, but it's not very easy to predict what that noise will do from day to day. So it's not useful in our prediction. And then what I've done is extrapolate forward to predict what the traffic would look like in the next week. And I could use this in some sort of planning exercise. The other thing that you get out of a model like this, though, and this is one of the things that I really want to emphasize, and I'm going to talk about this thing in my keynote as well, is when you're dealing with models, you should never be just trying to get an estimate of something. You should also be trying to understand the quality of your estimate. And in this case, I've illustrated the quality of those estimates, those predictions, by plotting 95th percentile 
um, confidence intervals around that prediction. And that gives you a really strong idea of how much you can trust that prediction. Um, and you can see that on the real data, those 95 percentile confidence intervals encapsulate the real data, except for these sort of spikes. Um, so that's the basic story about temporal modeling. There's a thousand techniques for doing prediction, um, ranging from Fourier analysis to time series analysis to principal components analysis. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's an awful lot that we could talk about in that domain. There are other things I need to get to there. So are there any, I should ask you guys if there are any questions. I'd give you a chance to put your hands up or something. Are there? As far as I can see, you're all quiet. So I, th I assume this means you understand everything I've said. So there will be a quiz, pop quiz at the end. So please do ask questions if, if you don't understand something. Okay, spatial patterns. Um, this is, again, a real traffic matrix. It's a snapshot of Abilene data, five minutes in length. The numbers tell you megabits per second, averaged over that five-minute interval. And... Uh, you can see that perhaps it looks a bit like a mess. Um, perhaps that looks a bit messy to you. The sources and destinations are POPs. Um, I haven't given their names here. They're places like Atlanta and Houston. Um, and you can see numbers that are quite big and other numbers that are quite small. It looks a bit like a mess. Okay, so what do we do with a mess like this? There are all sorts of ways to tackle modeling it, but um, ultimately it's about spotting patterns in here. And one of the things I've plotted here as well as just the numbers are the, um, these are the sums along the rows and these are the sums along the columns. And one of the things that I think you can see here, although it's not hard and fast, is that when I have a big column sum and a big row sum, I often get a big traffic matrix out. And the opposite is also true. When I have, say, let's look at a small, a small column sum, and then let's look at a small column sum here, I get a small traffic matrix there. Okay, so this is an observation many people have made. You can see it's obviously a, a general observation. It's not true about everything. For instance, I've got a pretty big number here, and I've got a big number here, and yet this guy is not that big. So it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just a general trend. But we can use this. We can use this to make progress. And the model it suggests is a thing called the gravity model. So you all know about gravity. I know this because you're sitting down and gravity is the thing that's holding you in your seat. Um, so how does Newtonian gravity work? Well, uh, you know, apart from people having recently discovered gravity waves, I really have no clue how gravity works, um, but I know what it does. And it exerts a force, and that force is proportional to the masses of the two objects and divided by the distance between them squared. And there's also this gravitational constant in there, but that's, a, that's just a, you know, scaling thing. The important thing is these two masses. Why are they important? Well, the, the beautiful thing about gravity, the thing that um, people didn't really get until perhaps Galileo, um, is that it doesn't matter what the things are made of. If you're made of human flesh or if you have something made of feathers or if you have something made of lead, the force of gravity only depends on the mass. It doesn't depend on anything else about so that leads to what we call a gravity model in traffic. And the idea of a gravity model in traffic is we'll end up with a formula that looks something like this. However, it's going to have a few differences. Obviously, we're not going to have the gravitational constant in here. We'll have some other constant. That's not a big deal. Um, and then we'll have some distance term. But if you think about the Internet, it doesn't cost me very much to send a packet from Australia to Belgium. In fact, I can send a packet across the room for about the same cost to me as sending it to Belgium. 
So I have no distance deterrence. There's no, there's nothing in the network that that pushes me away from sending my packets a long way. So I don't think R squared is going to be right. In fact, at least for moderate distances, I think I can replace this by a constant. That is, I don't care about distance very much at all. Is anyone going to complain? You're allowed to. You're allowed to tell me I'm wrong. I'll tell you why I think I'm right. But you know, you tell me when you think I'm wrong. Okay, this is the model we end up with, and it says the traffic between I and J, and this could be a origin destination, or it could be an ingress egress traffic matrix. We, we're not talking about those details yet. Traffic between I and J is just the traffic. Well, I am talking about ingress egress, aren't I? I've got in and out. Traffic in at I multiplied by the traffic out at J. So what this is saying is that the traffic between two locations doesn't depend on anything except their size. And we measure their size by the amount of traffic. And if you think about it, this is a traffic matrix. This is a source. Then if I add up all along that row, this is the traffic coming from that source. 163.38 is the ingress traffic at source three. And likewise, if you think about destination six and I add up that column, 51.76, that's the outgoing traffic at that destination. So if I think about this model, this gravity model, where I don't care about what the traffic is, I just care about the amount, then each element here This element here should be the product of this element and this element, the row and column sums that make it up. And so elements that are the product of two big numbers will be big, and elements that are product of two small numbers, let's go to something like that, will be small. Now, before we get too excited, you can see it's not right. Okay, There is a beautiful quote, and the quote is by... Box and Draper, and the quote goes, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. In your modeling work, just recite that to yourself as a mantra. Every morning when you wake up, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Modeling is not about getting a model that exactly fits data. It's not about getting a model which is right. It's about getting a model which is useful. Here's a plot of the accuracy of the traffic matrix. Now I've got real traffic matrix elements along the x-axis and estimated elements along the y-axis. This is actually from AT&T's network, so this is a much bigger network than Abilene and much larger volumes of data. And if the gravity model were correct, everything would line up along the diagonal line there, the solid line. But you can see these dashed lines, they're plus or minus 20%. And you can see that the gravity model is not even plus or minus 20%. So the question you might reasonably ask is, this is hopeless, isn't it? Isn't this completely inaccurate? Um, and the answer is, well, yes, but if we understand why, we will learn a lot about traffic matrices. So let me tell you, the worst bit of what we've done here. The worst bit is this is an ingress-egress traffic matrix. But the idea of a gravity model only really makes sense for an origin-destination traffic matrix, and I'll explain why. And it comes down to this hot potato routing. When I route like this, I create asymmetry in my traffic. And you see the traffic going from Perth to Sydney will go one way. The traffic from Sydney to Perth will come back the other way. That asymmetry is fundamental to the internet. We see it again and again and again in internet routing. And that means this gravity model, um, even if it works as an origin destination model, will not work as an ingress-egress model. So let me give you a concrete example just to prove that to you. So... I have, again, a cartoon model. It's a very oversimplified model of 
three autonomous systems. And um, I've got a ridiculously simple traffic matrix here. So let me describe it to you. Three autonomous systems, A, B, and C. And I have a traffic matrix between A, B, and C, which is completely uniform. So the same amount of traffic going from A to B and B to C and C to A and A to A and so on. It's all just one, one unit of traffic going from A to B and so on. But I've broken A into three locations, three points of presence, if you like. And I've evenly distributed the traffic between them. So when I look at the traffic matrix here, my origin destination traffic, I've split A into one, two, and three, and you can see that I've split A's traffic up into equal bundles. So the traffic from one to one is one ninth, and two to well, one to two is one ninth, one to three is one ninth, and the sum of this little corner is just one. So the traffic is completely uniform here. And the uniform traffic model fits the gravity model uh, as, as well as anything can. So this is a simple gravity model scenario. The origin destination traffic matrix follows a gravity model. So let's see what happens to this if I just look at A's traffic, if I look at the ingress egress traffic on A. Then I can break the traffic into four classes and each behaves differently. I have internal traffic, I have traffic coming into A, and I have traffic going out of A, and then I have traffic that's just outside of A altogether. And I'm going to look at each of the first three, but I don't need to look at the traffic outside of A because because it's outside of A, I never see it. I'm only looking at A. So I'm going to look at the first three. Here is the traffic internal to A. And again, let me remind you, I'm looking at an IE traffic matrix, which is an ingress-egress traffic matrix. Now, this is just that corner of the traffic matrix that I looked at before. It's the traffic from 1 to 3. It's the traffic from 1 to 2. It's these guys here. We knew what that was. That was that's trivial to work out. What about the traffic coming into the network? Well, when I look at traffic coming into the network, I have to think about traffic from one of these external networks like B coming to a POP in A. Now, POP1 is not connected to anything. So no traffic can come into POP1. Um, when I've looked at the traffic coming into POP2, I've assumed that traffic from B and C is going to be roughly evenly spread over all of these guys. Again, I've made this uniformity um, assumption, and therefore the traffic coming in at node 2 will be equally spread between 1, 2, and 3. And likewise, the traffic coming in at node 3 will go between 1, 2, and 3. Now, this is an assumption about traffic. This is an assumption about the balance of traffic. But what I've tried to do is take the most uniform assumption so that it's the least likely thing to wreck my gravity model. I've just kept with this idea of the traffic is going to be completely uniform. There is nothing in here that is devious or strange. But already you can start to see that there's some asymmetry creeping in. So I've got two bits of the traffic matrix, the internal traffic matrix. I've got the internal traffic. I've got the arriving traffic, the traffic coming into my network. And now let's look at the traffic going out of my network. And this is the weirdest one because this uses hot potato grab. So what have I done? Traffic going out of the network. Well, obviously it's going out of the network, so it can't be going to itself. But I've evenly split it amongst one and three. And that's, again, as two and three. That's, again, my uniformity assumption. What about the traffic here? Well, if the traffic comes into, if the traffic is leaving the network via um, two, if it starts in two, then it's always going to leave the network through two. This is the hot potato assumption coming in. If the network traffic originates in two, if it starts at two, then the hot potato assumption will mean it always leaves the network at two. There's no point in it going anywhere else in network A. And likewise, if the traffic starts at three, it will leave the network at three. Now you can see this weird guy doesn't look anything like a gravity model. So how do I get the total traffic? Well, I just take this one and this one and this one and I add them together and I get my ingress egress traffic matrix, which looks like this. Now the equivalent gravity model that would fit this data looks like this. 
and you can see they're just not the same. So what I've done here is show you that even though even though I start with an origin destination model that matches that gravity model perfectly, and I've made all uniformity assumptions all the way through, I end up with something that is in a gravity model. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is if I try and model um, this at a deeper level, and, and we call this in our work a generalized gravity model, although there are other meanings to that term. In the generalized gravity model, we just pull these parts apart and we model each of them separately. We take this bit and we take this bit and we take this bit. And again, the difficulty in doing this is you need to incorporate routing information into the problem. You need to actually know something about your network's routing in particular. It's BGP routing, and that's not something that's trivial to get data about, but people certainly can do it. If you do that, and then you build a model, a generalized gravity model, this is the picture of the errors you get on the right. This is the picture of the errors for the gravity model, and this is the picture for the generalized gravity model. Now, it's not perfect. It's much better. You can see that a very large part of the error in the gravity model has been taken care of. And you can see, for instance, there are quite a few points which actually line up along here or in plus or minus 20%. Not all of them. The generalized gravity model is not perfect again. But remember, Box and Draper. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. This is starting to get useful. Now, the place it becomes became really useful for us is the inference. We use this generalized gravity model as our prior model in that little optimization that I showed you earlier. And when we did that, we actually got really quite good estimates and uh, I think I, off the top of my head, our rough our RMS error was about 12%. Um, when we use this as a prior model for the tomography problem. Um, but you have to use the generalized gravity model because if you use the gravity model, obviously it's, it's going to be worse. Okay. Problems, there are many problems in this. Um, people are not sheep, um, for one thing. Uh, none of you will get this joke, but Australians aren't New Zealanders. People aren't cheap. Um, diagonal entries always cause a problem. People wonder sometimes why diagonal entries and traffic matrices aren't zero. Um, because if you think about it, you think about a traffic matrix, there's some traffic going from me to myself. But you have to remember that um, when we look at a traffic matrix, the thing that we're using as a source or destination is not atomic. It's not one object. It's actually a collection of routers, a collection of IP addresses, a collection. We don't tend to look at individual IP addresses in a traffic matrix. Um, what else? Well, content distributions, they make everything messy. Okay, so uh, the ultimate assumption in a lot of this is that traffic is being generated by people. Content distribution networks not only generate their own traffic, but also tend to change the whole distribution of traffic across the network to bring sources closer to people. And that distorts this model, clouds likewise. So there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of interesting research questions here and um, the vast amount of stuff we don't know. Um, what else? Just a quick plot I want to show you. Um, and I want to show you because it's relevant later. Um, this is, uh, again, a CCDF. It's a complementary cumulative distribution function. And this is of the Abilene traffic data. Uh, the solid curve shows the CCDF of the data. And you notice we have a log Y axis, but a linear X axis here. So this is not heavy tailed. This is not heavy tailed distribution. Normally, we would have to uh, plot this on a log log plot if it were heavy tail. You can see it's not heavy tone. It's relatively light tone. In fact, in fact, this is the dotted curve shows a log normal, which is somewhere in between truly heavy tailed and an exponential tail. And you can see that we're much lighter tailed. This is surprising to a lot of people because uh, one of the standard bits of doctrine in the internet is that everything is heavy tailed. 
Um, it started back with papers by people like Walter Willinger and then Falutsis, Falutsis, Falutsis and so on. Everything has a heavy tail, everything has a credo distribution. Um, in fact, it's not true. And when we look at traffic matrix data, we don't typically see heavy tails, although it can rule out that there isn't a traffic matrix out there somewhere that shows heavy tail behavior. Um, the other curve I have here is this dashed curve, and that's a gravity model. And I'm going to talk about that one a little bit later. And one of the really surprising things about this plot, um, it, it was an astonishing plot when I first saw it. The reason it's astonishing is because those two curves look almost the same. But remember, these are the errors in the gravity model. They're huge. So the gravity model doesn't work to predict individual elements, but it does predict the ensemble behavior. And that's really important because that means we can use the gravity model much more widely for what I'm calling traffic matrix synthesis. Um, and we'll get to that in a little while. But that curve, um, I mean, you never see curves that fit that well in this sort of domain. It just is amazing and surprising. And it's not just Abilene. We also see this in the Giant data as well. Using traffic matrices. Okay, so um, I want to start out by talking about how traffic matrices are used in network management. I've already mentioned this um, a little bit, but I want to put a little bit for, more formality around it and give you a few more, more concrete ideas about it. Um, so I start now these days by looking at FCAPS, which is a standard network management framework. Uh, it stands for Fault Configuration Accounting Performance and Security. Um, the part of this program that is most relevant to the work I do, most relevant to traffic matrices and so on, is the performance part of it. And that's about assuming that performance in your network is acceptable. It's about avoiding congestion. Um, but it also covers um, the traffic matrix work when we start looking at things like reliability analysis also comes, covers um, elements of fault analysis it also covers a little bit of accounting because traffic matrices can be used to collect network statistics as well. So stop thinking about network management as a goal, think about it as a process, um, and think about the interactions between models, measurement and management, and you start to have a nicely benevolent cycle. And in the middle of this is the mathematics we use to, to model these guys. So what are we going to talk about modeling here? Well, I thought probably one of the things I could do to inspire you a little bit is talk about what real network engineering goals are. So I have my list of network engineering goals here. And, um, you know, I, every network engineer I've ever met, they start with reliability. There is no network engineer I've ever met who says, oh, I don't mind if my network's down one day a week. It just does not happen. They all want their network to be glorious, and they get punished if it isn't. And the sort of punishment network engineers get is, um, you know, no one takes them out and whips them. They don't necessarily even get sacked, but it's a punishment that um, plays on people's self-esteem because the network, people who work so hard on a network, it becomes part of their life, and to tell them their network is crap, it's like saying their kids are crap. So network engineers, they care about reliability. They care about reliability to the point where it's number two on this list as well. It's not the only thing on the list. So things like cost matter. So optimization is an important part of this. Performance is an important part of this. And, and performance um, really, though, often gets wrapped up with reliability because your network is not reliable if the, net, if the performance is bad. If customers see packets being dropped or if they see bad performance, they don't ask whether the network's working or not. They just say your network's crap. They don't care what the distinction is. So reliability and performance are hooked up together. And then last, reliability. And, and maybe you're getting an idea of, of how important reliability is in this domain, but um, for people who are serious about running networks, it becomes... Um, an all-consuming um, sort of fire trying to build their network out to be um, more reliable than their competitors, to never have failures, never have failures that affect their customers, at least. So how do you do this? Well, there's all sorts of things that go into this. 
And a lot of them are really engineering, and I'm not going to talk about them all here. I'm, I'm sure you guys uh, know about redundancy and so on. But ultimately, part of it is about trying to be able to postulate scenarios and then work out what would happen if that scenario came to pass. What would happen if Link X fails? And it's not just about connectivity. It's about the congestion and performance impact when that failure occurs. So to do this sort of analysis, you need to know a lot about your network. You need to know about the network's configuration, its topology and its routing. You need to know about the fault risks in your network because just positing every possible um, failure will lead you down a, a garden path that you'll never come out of. Um, you also need to have performance models that will allow you to predict the behavior of your network in, in congestion, but ultimately you need traffic data as well, and that's where the traffic matrix comes in. So I have a little example here, um, and um, I have a plot. Plot's worth a thousand words supposedly, uh, but only if you explain it with a thousand words. So bear with me for a moment while I explain this picture. Um, this picture presents five different network designs for Abilene. So this is again using the Abilene data. Um, you'll notice that in here we have Abilene's actual design. It's the green diamonds. Um, and what I've recorded on the y-axis is bandwidth versus distance for the design. So this tells you how much the design costs, at least approximately. And you can see that Abilene's design is relatively low in cost. But Abilene's design, or the scale of the design I've used here, is to allow for the average traffic. That's a, that's a predicted traffic matrix for this network. If I want to deal with the fact that I might have errors in that prediction, that's what beta is about. Beta is the error in my prediction. And you can see that um, I've got here the pink curves. I've got what's called a robust Abilene design. And this is a design that allows for those errors. And to do that, it has overhead. It has extra capacity in the network. And this is a very standard engineering idea. Everyone knows this. If you, if you build something and you don't know if your estimates are exactly right, you put a bit of slippage, put a bit of leeway in there. So this design is just putting in leeway to account for the size of these errors. And you can see that as the error becomes bigger, I need more leeway, I need more overhead. But it's relatively constrained. What else have I got here? Um, okay, so Valium is another one to talk about. You remember maybe at the start I mentioned an idea called oblivious design, oblivious routing. Oblivious design says, I don't know anything about the traffic matrix. I know nothing. I'm completely ignorant. Um, all I know is the capacity in my network at the edge, and that tells me the, the maximum that I could have coming into my network. So now I'm going to design a network which could carry that maximum, and that's what Valiant Network Design is. Um, and it's beautiful. It's a, it's a, if, if you want to look at a really elegant idea in networking, go and have a read of this the paper about Valiant Network Design. Um, but you need a lot of overhead. And the overhead to do that is more than two times, or it's about two times the capacity Abilene network needed. But it will carry any traffic matrix. So it doesn't matter what the errors are in my network. The Valiant Design completely doesn't care what the errors are. It will carry any traffic matrix you like, any possible, any feasible traffic matrix. But it has this big overhead. Um, what's a robust clique? You don't really need to know about it. It's another alternate robust design, and you can see that it needs a lot more overhead to deal with errors. And the reason I've included it is because if there were no errors, the robust clique would be the absolute best um, you could do. And so the robust clique here is my baseline. It's, it's what I've used to talk about one unit of bandwidth distance. But it's really only there as a baseline. It's not a sensible design. You can see that as soon as errors become large, it's crazy. And the star design is another classic design that people use, and I've used that just as another benchmark. The important thing here, though, is that by understanding 
Firstly, that we know something about our traffic matrix, we can make measurements, but those measurements have errors. And if we know how big those errors are, we know how big an overhead to include in our design, we can almost always do better than the valiant design. You have to have, um, I should say, 0.8 or 1, beta being 1 would mean the errors are of the order of 100% errors. Beta being 0.4 is 40% errors. So um, even my gravity model, my crude, crude, crude gravity model, the errors are somewhere around 40% or 50%. And the design based on that model would still be superior to the Valiant design. So... Do it, does anyone use a Valiant design? I've never seen it actually used in the design of a wide area network, but they do use it in switch design. Um, so it's an interesting thing to look at. So other things to think about for network operators. When, you, when you're looking at predictions, how big are my errors going to be? How big should my errors be? Well, a lot of the error comes from predicting into the future. And, you know, predictions always, it's always looking at crystal ball, but it's not a guess. Um, generally speaking, it's much easier to predict what will happen with your traffic next week or in two weeks' time than in six months' time. So the size of these errors is very much dependent on your planning horizon. Your planning horizon is how far ahead you're trying to build your network. So perhaps you're building your network six months from now, you have to plan it based on predictions six months into the future. Um, traffic engineering, on the other hand, you're doing one day to two days or two weeks ahead, um, and there your predictions can be much better. So traffic engineering can take, traffic engineering can do less because you can't actually change the links. You can't add capacity to do traffic engineering. But because it uses a better prediction, it can still often benefit your network a great deal. Um, then if we think about anomaly detection, um, most people don't think about anomaly detection as prediction, but really anomaly detection is using the past to predict the future and look for big discrepancies, big changes. And so anomaly detection, what you really need to be able to do is prediction minutes to hours ahead so that you can look for changes that weren't expected. Okay. So... Um, because of the limits of time, I have not tried to tell you all the applications or all the ways people have used traffic matrix and so on. Again, I refer you to that tutorial for more information and certainly for a lot more references to the literature on what people have done in that domain. Um, what I want to talk about next is the difference between network operators and researchers. So network operators need to predict their traffic matrix, their real traffic, the traffic that's going to be carried on their network in six months' time. As a network researcher, as someone who might want to design a new routing protocol, I don't care what the traffic on AT&T is going to be in six months' time. I don't care what the traffic on Giant or Abilene is going to be in six months' time. What I care about is what the generic properties of traffic matrices are and how they affect my routing protocol. And even if I did care about real traffic matrix data, almost no operators actually share it. And even if they were willing to share it, they're often legally constrained to not share it. So, for instance, I know the Australian case uh, reasonably well. Network operators in Australia are covered by the Telecommunications Act, and the Telecommunications Act says they are not allowed to share data with anyone. Um, and it's very clear there are no provisions for research on the data. So they cannot give me the data. If I went and got a job there, I could look at the data. But I can't take it home with me to the university. So what do you do if you don't have any data? Here's my pop quiz. I lied a little bit. The pop quiz is not about traffic matrices. But just think about this for a minute. It's cute. It gives me a chance to have a, a, something to make my throat a little bit less dry. Okay, I don't want you to spend all day thinking about this. 
Who thinks it's A? B? I got a, I got, I saw someone's hand move. C? D. It, it's good to see some hands up, but this is a cheat of a question because no answer can be correct. If any one of those answers were correct, then the other, then it would intrinsically make it wrong. So, you know, for instance, if you said, uh, what's the chance of it being correct is, is 50%, then that means answer B is the correct answer, but the chance of getting B is now one in, um, Four, 25%. So it's one of those things like the Turing halting problem or Gödel's um, incompleteness theorems. It's self-referential in a really nasty sort of way. Hope I didn't put anyone off there. Because I need you to listen for another half an hour or so. We're getting near the end. We're getting there. And uh, I'm actually back on track in terms of time. So please remember to ask me questions if you have any sort of thoughts or anything you want to say, any comments you want to make as well. Okay. Um, when we want to do research, we often want to look at something like a new routing protocol. Um, when we want to generate um, test a routing protocol, we don't just want one traffic matrix. We want a whole bunch of them. Because we don't just want to get one idea of whether it worked or not. That's that's way too hit or miss. We'd like to see statistically how well it does. So we need to have an ensemble of traffic matrices. It's a group of them generated somehow randomly. And there are a whole there, there are a few examples that you might talk about. Um, there are other places where network operators might also um, like to use this sort of data. For instance, during greenfields planning. Um, but ultimately, it's about the fact that data is hard to get. And even if you could get data for, from Giant or Abilene or AT&T or, or a group of these, how representative would that data be? How accurate would it be as a general model for the whole internet anyway? We, we, we know there's tens of thousands of operators. How many of them would we have to survey before we believed our model was actually right? And, and the answer is a common one in internet measurement, which is we cannot hope to survey enough of the internet to really prove representation of any particular data set. So real data is really helpful, it's really useful, but it's not enough. Um, the other thing that I want to draw people's attention to these days is the issue of reproducible research. And this is, I think, an issue that all PhD students should be forced to listen to at some point, at some length. At our university, we actually run a small course for all starting PhD students, which is about um, research ethics and scientific method and about things like reproducible research. Um, and it, what it comes down to is, Research, scientific research is not science if no one can reproduce it. And there are all sorts of reasons people might not reproduce it. But ultimately, when you write a paper, when you get your first paper published, um, you have to remember that paper is really, it's more an advertisement for that research than it is the research. The paper is not the goal. The paper is not the goal. The paper is just the output. And the real goal, the real um, work is the code and it's the data and all those things that go together. As I said, traffic matrix data. ISPs don't share traffic matrix data except in a very limited way. They certainly don't make it public. They're not allowed to make it public in a lot of cases. Um, and so how do we do reproducible research in this domain? And more generally speaking, in incident measurement, how do we do reproducible research? Well, synthesis and simulation are the only really good answer. Um, they're not a complete answer, and certainly we still want to use real data. We certainly want to make network measurements. But synthesis combined with good measurements and good analysis gives us a way to get past this hurdle of reproducible research. So I have um, five criteria I've written here for um, Synthesis, and this is a this is much more general than um, just traffic matrices, and I call these the Skirk pro Skirk um, properties. Uh, you need an acronym, don't you? 
Yeah, maybe. Anyway, uh, simplicity, control, efficiency, realism, and consistency. So simplicity, I think everyone can understand at least broadly, but almost no one really gets how important simplicity is. So simplicity is the first thing I would always put on a list of criteria for models and for synthesis. Now, there are all sorts of rationales. So this going back to a thing called Occam's Razor, which is named after a monk called William of Occam, who said something in Latin that I can't remember. Um, Occam's Razor is actually, it's, it's often quoted, but it's actually a really unusable statement because it really doesn't have any technical meaning. A better one is this principle of parsimony, which is a much more precise, has a meaning in terms of modeling. It means your model should not have a lot of moving parts. It shouldn't have a lot of parameters. Um, and that's a good statistical principle. Uh, another place where this is talked about is a thing called Benini's paradox. Um, and I'll, the best expression of uh, Benini's paradox that I've ever seen is Paul Valeri's statement, everything simple is false, everything which is complex is unusable. And it's about that Venn diagram and it's about tractability. If you have a model which is complex enough to model all of the interactions of all of the people in the world, then it will tell you nothing about them. Um, the classic analogy people use is a map. Imagine a map. Any map you have yes, is inaccurate. Any map you have has a gross level of simplification of the real world. So why don't we make better maps? Why don't we make a map, for instance, which is as detailed? Let's make a one-to-one -one map. Let's make a map that is exactly as detailed as the real world. How much use would that be? Exactly zero, because we already have the real world. We don't need a map that has the same level of detail. It does nothing. It tells you nothing that the real world doesn't already tell you. There is an innate need to simplify in order for models to actually be helpful to us. You have to get yourself over the idea that that makes it false. It does, but that simplification has value in its own right. And there is this tension, this uh, trade-off between simplicity and between complexity and reality that's always there in any modeling exercise. I would say if you're ever starting out in any domain, err on the side of simplicity. However, there is the famous joke. Um, do I need to tell you this joke or can I just say, assume the cow is a sphere? Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I'm not seeing a lot of people chuckling, so I'm, I'm guessing this is a mathematician joke uh, and shared amongst only mathematicians. But I'll tell you at the end. I'll tell you what it is at the end. Um, oversimplification is obviously dangerous, but it's an art to work out the right level that you should get to. Um, control is important. Okay, so this is something that people underestimate. You need to be able to play with your model and you need to be able to do things with it. So, you know, a classic thing with um, a network model would be what happens when my network grows? Can I do that? Can I scale the network? Um, what happens if uh, I spend half the amount of money on my network over the next 10 years? What will tend to happen with my traffic? Will that change it? So there's, there's these questions you would like to ask, and in order to ask them, you need to be able to control your um, simulation. Efficiency is obviously important. Um, we don't just want to generate one traffic matrix, we want to generate an ensemble of them. They're big things in their own right, potentially. Uh, the ones I've shown you are tiny, tiny little examples, but you can easily imagine having a thousand by thousand traffic matrix um, for every five minutes over a year, and suddenly you have a lot of data entries in there. So you need an efficient way to generate that. Um, we do want them to be realistic. Realism is a very hard concept to get your head around, though, when you actually try and quantify. And the way we often quantify realism of a model is we just do an error estimate between our model and some data. That isn't good enough. And I could spend the next hour telling us why uh, I think that that's not good enough. But ultimately, um, realism is important, but sometimes it's overrated. And I think the interplay between realism and simplicity is a very important one. And then there's a more technical consist, uh, uh, criteria of consistency. And really what that's saying is 
if I change my model in some way and then do a comparison, can I actually do an apples for apples comparison or is it just completely different? And this is a more technical condition and it's a little bit, um, I'm not gonna to talk too much more about it now, but it's, it's something that you, you can do it. Okay, formalities, we wanna generate an ensemble. I've already told you this, it's a collect collection of instances, but more formally, it's some collection, often an infinite collection, usually infinite in fact, um, often uncountably infinite, um, with some sort of probability measure. And the probability measure tells you how to draw from that entire ensemble. So if something's got a high probability, it's more likely to be pulled out of the ensemble. If it's got a low probability, it's less likely to. But um, one of the problems we have is that, and I'll talk about this in my, again, I keep putting, putting you off with things I'm gonna talk about, but even though we might have a probability measure, that does not mean that we can actually draw these guys out trivially um, because the probability measure might be intractably hard to calculate. So we might need to have some procedure for actually, or an algorithm for actually pulling out the members of this ensemble. The other thing about the ensemble is, um, don't give me a trivial ensemble, and a trivial, ens trivial ensemble, for instance, has one member, one instance. And uh, I just keep giving you the same instance again and again. This is an ensemble, it has a probability measure, but it's boring and it's useless. It doesn't give me any of the controlled statistical variation I want in my model. Um, you might say, how dumb would you be to create a model which has only one instance? I have seen it done and I've seen the person write a paper and I've seen that paper in Sincon. And so uh, I'm, perturbed sometimes about some of the things that go on, but um, it's not as hard as you think because when you come up with an algorithm to generate these guys, you can often disguise the fact that you're only really generating one element. And then particularly when you're generating a traffic matrix, so let's get into another issue of a traffic matrix. If I take a traffic matrix, the exact labeling of the rows and columns is arbitrary. So if I take a traffic matrix and I swap two rows and then I swap the corresponding columns, I think of that as exactly the same thing. It's what I would call isomorphic to the original traffic matrix. Um, I don't want an ensemble which has one traffic matrix and all of its isomorphic um, siblings because effectively they're all the same traffic matrix. So this is the sort of thing I mean. It's very easy to accidentally come up with a procedure which you think generates a lot of random traffic matrices. And when you look at them, they all look different. But the only reason they're different is that under permutations of the rows and columns, they look different, but they're actually all isomorphic. So please don't do that. Okay. We also want to incorporate some of our knowledge into this traffic matrix. Maybe we have some data. Maybe we want to compare our results to someone else who did have some data but we often have some preconceived notions that we want to incorporate into our model. But along with that, I would like it if every time someone wrote a paper, they could write exactly what assumptions were in their model and not leave anything out. I don't want any unstated assumptions. I don't want implicit assumptions. And those sort of assumptions are dangerous because uh, you start seeing patterns which are just the result of the patterns you put into the problem. You assume that all traffic has a 24 hour period, so all of your results have a 24 hour period. Big whoop, it's not a real surprise for anyone. Um, but if you don't know that you've made an assumption like that, then it's hugely dangerous. So we wanna be able to incorporate assumptions, but only the assumptions which we want to put in there, not anything extra. Does that sound reasonable? I'll, I'll assume that you believe it's reasonable. So let's go through. Let's go through modeling traffic matrices and simulating traffic matrices, synthesis of traffic matrices. And I'm gonna go through simple, complex, simple. Start simple, try and incorporate some of the more complex things, and then we'll get back to simple at the end. So what's simple at the start? Um, this is just the gravity model. Okay, so um, way back here. Let me go back, 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 
but it's getting late at night here. I'm starting to get a bit silly. Apologies for that. Okay. Why did this work? Why did my gravity model work? Well, this is actually generating an ensemble of traffic matrices that have a property in common with the real traffic matrices, um, and that's great. So this is my simple model. It's the traffic matrix. If you look at this paper, you will find a paper written about synthesis of traffic matrices. It's probably the simplest paper I've ever read, uh, written. Um, maybe the simplest I've ever read, maybe. Um, it's the sort of thing that a uh, MATLAB program to generate this traffic matrix, you could probably write it in one line of code. The actual code I used to generate this is probably six lines because I just, um, you can see I'm a waffler, a very, very verbose. Um, but you could probably write the code to generate this traffic matrix in one line. It's ridiculously simple. It's just a gravity model. All you need to do, you know, one of the beauties of MATLAB is it lets you do matrix algebra very easily. So all you do here is you generate two random, a random row, row and a random column and you multiply them. It's so, so simple. It's just crazy simple. And yet it does this, it works so well. Okay, so that's simple. And by the way, uh, that paper was written, I think 2005 or 2006, it's quite a long time ago now. Um, no one came along and corrected it. And, and eventually I had to correct it because I knew there's some problems with it. Um, no one came along and corrected it though, which is a bit strange, I think. Okay, complex. So we know there's some problems with this. Um, we know there's some problems because uh, when we look at gravity models and compare them to real data, the real data does not match this gravity model. And the bit that doesn't match particularly badly is the structure of the whole traffic matrix. So the individual elements, their statistics work pretty well. But if you look at, say, a row or a column or one of these sorts of items, they don't really fit the gravity model. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. The simplest reason is really this fact that we're looking at ingress, egress traffic matrices. But even if I take that into account, there are fairly large errors. So what else is going on here? Well, you remember I said that it doesn't cost anything to send a packet from Adelaide to Brussels, okay? Um, it does cost a little bit, a little bit more than sending it across the room. Not much, tiny bit. Um, but there are some other issues about long distance traffic that are important. For instance, um, I don't speak French, um, except I can say merci, but I can only say it with a horrible, horrible accent. So I don't, I can't read a French web page. So the chance of me looking at a web page in Brussels is much lower than me looking at a web page in Australia. And it's simply a language issue. Um, likewise, you imagine people in China, they're much more likely to browse Chinese web pages than random pages in Australia. So that introduces some distance into the problem, and it's not a physical geographic distance, it's a cultural distance. Um, what else? Well, um, there are time zones. So we're just about in the sort of opposite time zones here. You guys are in the morning, I guess it's almost coming up to lunch for you. Um, I'm hoping I get to go home and uh, um, see my family soon. So um, time zones change this. Now, they change it in a wacky sort of way, and I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but ultimately, if you think about it, if two people in Australia are likely to, more likely to communicate, because we're more likely to be awake at the same time, whereas the chances are that I'm going to talk to someone in Brussels directly is just a little bit less because there's less times of day when we're both awake and both active. And so time zones distort that locality of information as well. What else? Um, content distribution networks I've already mentioned, uh, hosting, all those sorts of things. Try and bring, they try and bring the server close to the customer, close to the browser. And so that introduces locality. That makes it look more like traffic should be um, local rather than international. So all of these things break that simplistic gravity model. How do I fix it? Well, one way of fixing it would be to exhaustively describe these various phenomena I've talked about, 
and try and build them into a mathematical model. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it, but I'm saying I can't do it. Um, it's there's too many bits here. There's too many moving parts, too many things going on at once. Um, do I try and deal with cultural difference or do I deal with time zones or do I deal with uh, asymmetry of routing or do I deal with content distribution? And which bits are more important and which bits are less important? And um, it's exhausting even thinking about it. And I certainly wouldn't want to try and teach it in the next 10 minutes, which is roughly what I have to get through. Okay. So complex is bad. So let's come back to simple. What could we do that's still simple and yet allows us to build in some of this complexity? So I think about problems mathematically. I want to think about how I would tackle this as a mathematical problem. Let's forget about traffic matrices altogether. Um, let's talk about the things we know about traffic and let's call them axioms or assumptions or um, implicit knowledge or, or about these or data even. Um, and let's build models that don't accidentally surpass those assumptions. And those assumptions we want to incorporate into the model. So how do you incorporate assumptions into a model mathematically? Well, generally we incorporate them as equations. So um, I would now want to translate these assumptions into something I can use in my modeling. I would call them constraints. And we write them down as equations. So a simple constraint might be something like um, the total number of routers in Adelaide is three. And so there's no way Adelaide can generate more than 10 terabits per second. That's a constraint. And I know it might work because I know something about it. Um, and we could start to build equalities and inequalities that express these sorts of constraints. If we do this, then the natural model that we should arrive at is a thing called a maximum entropy model. Um, do I dare try and explain maximum entropy to you? Um, I have a bunch of words here about maximum entropy. Um, let me have a quick go at it because I think entropy is one of the most interesting little bits of mathematics ever invented. Um, it owes its origin to Claude Shannon. Um, and uh, there's a whole huge story to it. But um, suffice it to say that Shannon defined entropy by looking at the probability distribution. Here we will be looking at the probability distribution of traffic matrices. So P of X would be the probability of any particular traffic matrix. And he defined entropy over an ensemble as minus the sum over the probabilities times the log of the probabilities. And there are all sorts of reasons why this is the particular formula he came up with. Um, we don't have time to go into that. In fact, I, you know, you can do an entire course on information theory, which will tell you about this guy. Um, but it's one of those beautiful bits of theory which turns out to be tractable and interesting and useful. And it's been interesting. Your mobile phone, where's my mobile phone? I was going to wave it in front of you. This thing, this thing is a little embodiment of Shannon's formula. This is a, uh, you know, the ultimate expression of coding and information theory, which comes out of this formula for entropy. One way of thinking about entropy, and a very useful way of thinking about it, is as a measure of uncertainty over that distribution. So if we were to maximize or find a distribution X that maximizes uncertainty, maximizes H, subject to our constraints, our assumptions or our prior knowledge, then that would be the distribution or the ensemble that has the most uncertainty in it, the most uncertainty out of all of the possibilities. 
Another way of expressing most uncertainty is to say there are no other hidden assumptions, no other hidden twerks, no other, other hidden quirks in that data. So finding the maximum entropy distribution is equivalent to trying to get rid of, to, to weed out any of these sort of implicit or hidden assumptions in that ensemble. Because we've expressed it mathematically, finding the P of X that does this maximization is just an optimization problem. And actually, it's, it's often not too hard an optimization problem. In fact, there's some very general results about this. So you don't even have to do any optimization. A lot of the time, um, the solutions are already known. You don't have to pull out your optimization toolkit or do anything. You can just look up known results for this. So it's very well studied. Very Lots of problems are solved in this domain. And, and we know how to get, how to get results. Um, I should say, just because you know P of X, it doesn't mean you know how to get X. So that's one little thing that's an issue still. But um, let me give you an example. Okay, so uh, this is a particular cooked example. And the reason I have this example is because I wanted to compare um, algorithms for doing network planning. And I wanted to compare them to the Valiant design. Now, the Valiant, the Valiant design says, I don't know anything about the traffic matrix, except I know that um, I have a limited capacity at the edge and I can't have more traffic coming into the network than that. So one way of expressing some um, knowledge of, of those edge constraints is to look at the row sums of my matrix. The row sums tell me how much traffic is coming into the network. And the column sums, these guys, show me how much traffic is going out. So here I've constrained the expectation or the average value of the row sum and the column sum. I could have made that a hard constraint, but hard constraints actually are too easy. Um, it's more fun dealing with soft constraints, average constraints like this. Um, hard constraints actually just you get models that drop out. It's a bit, bit too easy. So we're dealing with the expectation here. And I'm just saying the average of the row sum is going to equal some vector. And I'm just going to give that to you. Ah, and that's given by the edge capacity of the network. So what I'm assuming is that I'm butting up against the maximum. I could have made this an inequality. I could have made this a less than. Um, but there's no point. I want, to, I want to look at the worst case. I want to look at the case where we're butting up against the edge. Um, and I have this constraint on the total traffic and this extra constraint relating the row sums and column sums. These are just consistency constraints. All I really need is the row and column sums. If I take these constraints, then the maximum entropy model that I get comes from taking my traffic matrix X, which is T. T is just this total here, multiplied by a row vector U and a column vector V transpose, where U and V are just vectors of independent exponential random variables whose average matches the row and column sums. Um, now, that's almost exactly, that's almost exactly the gravity model that I proposed earlier. And this is why I believe that gravity model works so well, because at an ensemble level, at a statistical level, it's the maximum entropy distribution. So it's the distribution which imposes the least extra assumptions about the traffic matrix other than the things that we have just measured, the row and the column sums. It's not exactly the same as the model I had before. The difference is subtle, and I'm not going to try and explain it in the next, I guess I'm almost out of time at this point. I'm not going to try and explain it. Um, I'm happy to afterwards or by email or, or anything you like, but there is a subtle little difference in this, and it comes to about the way we scale things. Okay. Um, the stuff I'm talking about appeared in our SICOM paper this year, uh, sorry, last year, August last year. Um, so we deal with a lot of different cases in that paper and we deal with a lot of, um, we deal with spatio-temporal structure, we deal with things like constraints on variance, which might represent errors in measurement, we deal with soft versus hard constraints, and we even do talk about the constraints I've looked at here are all linear constraints, but you can deal with convex constraints. And the beautiful thing about maximum entropy is it builds up in a modular way. So you can take certain assumptions, work out what they mean, and then 
take other assumptions, work out what they mean, and then put them together, and you can do it as sort of block operations. So the beautiful thing about Max Entropy is it does give you a really good way of building these ensembles. Um, the tricky thing is that just because you know this probability, you know the probability distribution, does not mean that you can trivially generate instances from the ensemble. However, there are algorithms to do this. The classic one is a thing called Markov Chain Monte Carlo, and this is a very well-studied algorithm. Naive implementations of Markov Chain Monte Carlo are very slow, but there is a vast amount of work on trying to make it faster, and we've incorporated some of that into the code that we've provided at this GitHub site. So if you want to play with traffic matrices, please can I encourage you to go and try this code out and tell us what's wrong with it. Um, I'm sure there are things about it that are um, suboptimal, and I know one thing about it is that it's not particularly easy to configure at the moment. That's a problem we're working on and that hopefully we'll have a solution to in the very, very near future. Um, so, if you'll indulge me for one or two minutes before you go off to lunch. Other beautiful thing about it, um, maximum entropy is it creates a matrix, it creates a relationship between models and assumptions, and you can go backwards and forwards here. So I've talked about taking a group of assumptions, and from them I can generate a model which I can use to synthesize traffic. But I can also take a model and I can reverse engineer it and try and understand what assumptions went into that model. Um, and that tells me something about um, uh, what people are really thinking when they build models. And I, I like that. So, very quick recap. I promise I'll be leaving you very soon. Intro, we talked about what a traffic matrix was. Then we talked about measuring traffic matrices and inferring traffic matrices from linked data SNMP data. Um, these have been big areas of research in this domain, but I think, and I, I think uh, this is borne out by the literature, they've started to peter out. And part of the reason for that is because NetFlow has become far more ubiquitous in recent years. NetFlow um, still is not 100%. And part of the reason you can't collect NetFlow everywhere on your network is because you'll have legacy devices which didn't do it, or you'll have some place where you collect NetFlow um, and it slows the router down too much for that bit of the network. And so, um, you know, it's still rare to find a network which is completely universally instrumented with NetFlow, but certainly NetFlow makes the problem of getting your traffic matrix much, much easier. We talked a bit about what they look like and, and some issues in modeling uh, traffic matrices. And uh, I have to emphasize, this is the junior G with super fast introduction to this. Um, I'd love to talk again and go into a little bit more detail in just one slice of this modeling exercise, but I tried to cover a lot of ground today. Um, and then I talked about how to use traffic matrices. And again, I, I tried to cover a fair bit of ground, but I did try and dig into one particular use of them in a little bit more detail. And then finally, and uh, I guess this is the stuff that isn't in the tutorial um, paper that I pointed you at, the chapter of the SIGCOM book. Um, this is the stuff about traffic matrix synthesis. And I talked particularly about the work that's in our SIGCOM paper last year, but also some of the work that um, I peripherally touched was in a paper in Sigmetrics the year before. And um, I'd love it if you guys tell me what's wrong with those papers and, and come back and do something about it. Finally, I talked a lot about traffic matrices, but I also hope to make a deeper point about research in this domain. And part of that was about reproducibility, but part of it was about trying to choose problems. And, and part of choosing problems is to try and get into this intersection between these three sort of areas. And if you do that, you'll have a long and successful career. If you can hit two of them reliably, you'll have a good career. Um, if you don't bother, don't think about this at all, and you end up somewhere on the outside, um, you'll find life frustrating. And uh, that's it. That's the end of the talk. So, um, I, it's traditional. Well, I'll let you go.
So thanks. I think we have some time for to to get to get questions. And I would ask the uh, the students just to, to come here. Uh, we don't have a wireless microphone. Um, I've scared everyone into submission. <laughs> You can put a question in human format. You don't have to write the formula. Huh? Just ask in text. Um, so one of the good things about doing this over the internet, um, and I, I'm not sure I only enjoy doing a talk over the internet, but one of the good things is that you can email me questions. Um, I'll be very happy to try and answer them. Um, I think there's also some texty sort of facility on here that you can type, but maybe you guys in the audience can have access to that. So whatever you want to do, but obviously right now is a good chance. <laughs> can, can I just uh, must want to go. ask you a very quick question? So, so do you think uh, whether to, as the as the um, content based networking and and CDN will develop further? Do you think this will have a dramatic effect on the research on traffic matrix, or this it will be a just let's say an adaptations of methods and problem, but the bulk of the math of the problem will remain the same? Okay, can you just spend a comment on it? Okay, so um, it's really hard for me to talk about content-centric networking and some of the more advanced networking topics and, and say what they will do. But content distribution networks have already changed things. And um, you only have to look at, you know, the volumes of traffic that come out of particular services like Netflix, um, like Google's data center, like Amazon, to understand that um, those guys are game changers. Um, but having said that, um, when we look at traffic, say, on the scale of a country, say Australia, I don't think they change things too terribly. I think what they do is introduce distance as a parameter, not as a complete um, throw it out the window sort of deal. When we deal with things on a global scale, though, I think they really do. They they are disastrous for simple models like gravity models. I don't think I don't think it's reasonable to try and use a gravity model to try and model the global internet anymore. Um, Perhaps it never was, but certainly now I think content distribution and hosting and those sorts of things have, have completely distorted it. Um, um, on the other hand, there's some interesting problems within those content distribution networks. So one of the questions uh, you know I've been asked recently is about planning of the network that the content distribution networks use themselves. Um, and you, know, you should realize that some of these content distribution networks, some of these um, big hosting um, guys, they run some of the biggest networks in the world now. And their planning process, their traffic, um, again, might reasonably fall a gravity model. Because again, what they've done is shift the demand out to the edge, but within their network, it's still the same old traffic. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said for these sort of simple models. Does that answer the question? Yeah, 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 it was. Okay, uh, any more questions from the student side? So if not, as uh, Matt said, he stay, uh, stay remains available to be maybe contacted or get questions via email. So with that, um, I yes. would close this session. And thanks a lot, really a lot, Matt, for being available. <laughs> um.